I don't think that. Mr. Kern, you have to know how to turn the microphone on. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. These are not the latest technology. Okay, These that's are true. ancient. That's the problem. <laughs> so the majority of our schools have been upgraded to the various cohorts so that they're, you know, they can utilize the full bandwidth that we have. The last portion that we're working on is cohort eight, which has been escalated to try and get done before the end of the school year. That will eliminate that. You know, we have a full hundred uh, gig to the internet through the district, so that should not be a problem anymore. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. I might also recall we did change providers after we'd had a very significant uh, number of issues one year during testing season not too long ago, and so we actually changed providers as well. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, I have another question about the CARES Act funding. Um, I think it was Member Cobert who mentioned this one about delaying this, the start of school for students to begin, but offering teachers not in advance as much as paying them for um, the training using the CARES Act money. So um, there is plenty of training that we could do for our teachers and for parents and for students to make sure that we have a, a solid start um, when we do go back to school. And I think those are, we have a lot of serious protocols in addition to the technological training. We're revamping how we do school. And I think that that investment in time by all of our employees and in, in paying our employees for learning all of these is, is worthy or worthwhile of, of that commitment. So I think even though Mr. Palmerini said that he was a buzzkill when it comes to the CARES Act funding, I think there is a way if we are paying our, our employees for that additional training and all of the, inf the work that they'll be doing. So, uh, Member Castor Dunnell, if I could, because I know that the next segment is going to cover um, the CARES Act and financial implications, and I know we're all interested in that question. Can we let Mr. Um, Kelly respond to that question when he's going through his presentation? Yes. Okay. Perfect. I I didn't really need a response. I would just kind of. Oh, I think we a, all want to. We all want to. Statement. No. But yeah. Yes, but I think you. we're all interested in that. So let's cover that <laughs> at one time. That's fine. And that's my last. Okay. Statement. Okay. Great. <laughs> and I, I so an important issue. I just want to give it its due. Um, I have just a couple of just two really quick questions um, because the rest of the board members have done a great job of asking the questions. Um, the shields. So I was glad to see we're looking at the shields for our K through two. Is it an option to have shields? It seems to me, I haven't used one, but it seems like that would be an easier tool to keep on our children's face and, and probably an easier thing to function with. Could that be an option for um, all of elementary school? And if you don't have an answer now, just um, for next week, if you can let us know. Yeah, it, it is certainly an option. There are some pros and cons to it because, as uh, Dr. Pino mentioned, it doesn't stop um, as a face mask would capture everything. It doesn't stop it, but it's certainly a possibility. We have, we'll have some numbers for you okay, on, the, on you. the difference in the cost. And then the one, other, um, the, the one other thing that I think I was confused about with the um, launch ed model. Um, and, and I actually am still confused. Some of the board members' questions I thought helped clear it up for me, but I was envisioning that this option was going to help us bridge the gap between the teachers who are not in a safe place to come back to school for um, medical, personal, or family reasons, that they would be able to come in and work in a classroom or possibly even at home, but in a classroom environment where they're not, the kids are not there, all the kids are there virtually. So I was thinking we were marrying up the kids that wanted to do the launch ed and the, and the teachers who needed to be isolated from the students. And that cohort, I guess you would call it, was self-isolated. Yes, the teacher would be coming on the campus, but much less contact if all they're doing is walking in with a face mask, going to their classroom, and leaving. They could potentially even get there early, leave later if they didn't want to mm -hmm. interface. 
Um, so I thought it was a great way of marrying up those two populations. And what I'm hearing is that might be the case, but it might be that the classroom is blended with kids in classroom and kids um, in lawn shed. So could it be either or? Is it a matter of trying to match those numbers up? Help me up, Dr. That's Jacobs. It. You, you already hit it. Okay. Hit the nail on the head. So. The best case scenario, we believe, is that the teacher is in the classroom and all of her students are off campus. Just can't guarantee that the numbers are going to match that exactly, so there may be some instances where we can't have exactly that number and we can't afford to have uh, a class at home that's only 11 or so, and then the other teacher on campus has to have larger numbers. So we may have to mix and match. Our preference is that the teacher has her entire class at home. That's, that's what we're aiming for. Right. We'll know when we see what the numbers okay, look like. Okay, thank you. That helps me tremendously because I, the great value of being able to keep a larger number of our teachers safe rather than them all having to look at Florida Virtual School, mm -hmm. I think is a huge advantage. But I do understand that until we know those numbers, until we get those first semester commitments, we really can't know exactly Correct. how that's going to work out. Correct. That was my only, uh, my only last two questions was because everybody did a phenomenal job. Let me go to Member Gould, Vice Chair Gould. Might be on mute. Vice Chair Gould, are you with us? Oh, I'm sorry. Can that's you hear me? A, we now can, yes. Can you hear me? Okay, sorry. Uh, I would like to circle back to the um, discussion on maybe delaying the start of school and trying to find compensation for our employees since there would be a disruption in their um, regular start dates. Could they qualify for the unemployment for those weeks? Or could we partner with the county because I know in the CARES Act money, they got public um, public employees were included in that and, and maybe offset some of that salary differential for that period of time. Not so much out of our education and asking for a waiver, but going a little bit more the traditional um, CARES Act route, utilizing some of those unemployment. Um, I know you might not be able to answer that tonight, but I, I would like to, to know unless you've already investigated that. We'll look into it. Okay. And then uh, having been part of the families in middle school when we had kind of the, the houses or the, the teams, that worked beautifully for my oldest son, and um, there's a lot of benefits to it as well. So I think families would find the, the cohort um approach really uh something kind of special and unique for for this time period and might even be a positive outcome for what we're having to go through right now so uh and thank you everybody else for covering all of my thoughts and questions thank you back to you member gala um thank you madam chair i just have a few follow-up questions <clears throat> and some of them we might not be able to answer but the first one i want to ask so I thought someone might, might else might get to it. But if we have a teacher that, that is on campus and kids in her classroom, or any staff member for that matter, and they get sick and they're forced to self-isolate for 14 days, how will that impact their pay? And if they get COVID and they have to be at home until they test negative and it's a month, Will they have to use all their time? And if they do use all their time, how will they get compensated? Dr. Vasquez, go ahead. Currently, we have um, the practice in place where an employee is diagnosed um, or has come in contact with an individual um, diagnosed with COVID-19 or the coronavirus. Um, they work through um, Jason Matura. Um, we actually uh, give them temporary duty. Um, they get tested and then um, until their results come back. Uh, if they, uh, the results come back and they test um, positive, uh, they remain temporary duty until the duration and then they come back. 
some, some individuals who do not have symptoms uh, continue to work at home uh, during that temporary duty, but those that um, are experiencing some of the more severe symptoms, then um, we keep them on uh, temporary duty until they return back. Awesome. So they wouldn't have to use their, their sick time or their leave? No. Currently, no. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I got lots of emails on that questions. Um, I was also fire drills. I, I know that it's a state statute. It's a, in a federal, um, but are we going to get any flexibility on fire drills and the safety um, drills that we have to do monthly? It's on our list. We don't have a waiver on that, but it, it would make sense to us that you wouldn't have children all going out in mass and congregating. It, it certainly flies in the face of what we're trying to do, but we would need a waiver. Okay, thank you. And then in, in terms of launch ed, if we had some of our ESE students choose the launch ed model, and they had an IEP that required them to have like one-on-one, -on -one, like a one-to-one -one aid. What would that look like? Would they still be provided the one-to-one -one aid in the classroom that would work with them, I guess, virtually? Like, what would that, what would that look like? I thought you were gonna ask if the aid could go to their home. I knew the answer to that. <laughs> I, knew, I knew that was a no. Dr. Vasquez, I'm so, not sure what it would be. Uh, right, so that is a, um, a good question uh, for which we do not have um, an answer. What we, I can tell you what we did through um, distance learning, those students that had um, on their IEPs that they had a one-on-one -on -one pair, or for some students who may have needed help with translations, they did it virtually, either uh, by phone or in some cases using some type of video conferencing. Our feedback on that is that it was not um, as effective and uh, did not uh, meet the purpose for having um, that one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, para or assistant assigned to that child. And so that is something that we would, um, we would have um, the IET, IEP team sit down and discuss and, and uh, figure out what is the best way. Obviously, virtually we could do it, uh, but we didn't have positive um, feedback when we did that through distance learning. Okay. Thank you. In fact, I'm gonna add that to the question for our next, um, uh, no, the, the one with the um, piece for change. You. And then um, I had a question, and I know it's been brought up a couple times, so I just need to circle back to it. I know that the launch ed is, is a commitment of one semester, or virtual is one semester, for obvious logistical reasons. Um, but it occurs to me that it would make sense that instead of going to our continuity plan or distance learning, if we had a child that was in classroom that was a hybrid model that had launch ed and actual kids and they got sick or they got the COVID, um, that since they're already in that classroom setting, that they should be able just to go home and do launch ed from home. I mean, that's kind of a continuity of services and that's where we mm -hmm. need to be innovative. So is that a, a possibility that they could just do that for three or four days and come back without choosing that model? Uh, absolutely, they okay. would have to come back after that incubation period, mm -hmm. which um, may not be three days. Well, I think the issue is if they are in a face-to-face -face classroom that does not have that option, that then we would um, look to pivot to launch ed, um, which, is uh, very similar to launch at, at home, but doesn't have that duality. And so it would be more of a, a, a virtual model. But all of that would need to be outlined in our continuity plan. Uh, the state will give feedback on the plans this time as well, um, I, is, is what I've read. And um, while in the past it was a matter of just submitting it and they approved it, um, that's not the case. And so we would have, in, in fact, if I'm not mistaken, there are specific areas for us to not only address that pivot, but with specific populations as well, like ESC, ELL, um, uh, and, and other subgroups. So the, the continuity plan is much more extensive and is going to, and will probably have to have more than one option based on the models that you choose to forward with. Wonderful. And then I believe it was Member Lopez who, who discussed uh, if a certain model is not working for a student, again, back to that one semester rule, would they be able to switch? And I, I, I believe 
in the emergency order, there was guidelines that if a child is struggling, if progress monitoring shows that they're sliding back, that we have to offer them another alternative or another scenario so that we can move them forward and make sure that there's not more learning loss. Is that correct? The progress monitoring is meant for us to ensure that children are successful and we would have to provide interventions. Um, and if those interventions do not prove um, to be successful, then yes, we would, we would need to change. And, and I can see that most, um, most happening with a child who is in virtual learning that then would need to come into a face-to-face -face situation. Although you know, the opposite could, could occur as well, but I see it more in the other. Thank you. Um, and are we, and I mean, this is probably for Dr. Jenkins, um, are we working with other districts to kind of provide continuity? We, we, you know, we are so close to Osceola, to Lake, to Seminole, and we have teachers, we have parents that work in those counties and their kids go to school here and vice versa. So are we working to kind of offer some type of continuity? I uh, actually meet and discuss regularly with a cohort group of Central Florida superintendents we will not be identical because some went out um, a, a bit ahead of the group. Um, others will be close, very similar to our plan. Well, I guess most, some people have to go back and redo their plans that pr provided, uh, presented it earlier because now it won't meet some of those requirements. But we are in discussion, but openly acknowledge they, they probably won't be identical. We're trying to stay close. Okay, thank you. And then um, on, on, in reference to Orange County Virtual Schools, um, I got a question. There's no, currently there's no um, postings for teachers. Are we waiting until we get numbers to decide how many teachers we may need to add and then we'll do the postings at that time? Sorry. Yes, ma'am. So, so, for example, we just um, got permission to add a couple more teachers today uh, through Dr. Vasquez. So you'll see those postings come up. I think it was in elementary uh, and a couple other secondary positions. So as, as they are needed, we, we post them. Okay. Thank you. Absolutely. And then um, after school activities, are we looking at our community partners? Are we trying to work? Um, with community partners to be innovative, you know, with the parents um, that have to go back to work, that may need after school activities. Are we going to move forward as usual with after school activities or after school care? We are, uh, and currently we're partnering with both the Boys and Girls Club and the YMCA at some of our sites, and they're providing um, summer camps. Uh, and uh, they actually have. A good system set up uh, for uh, social distancing and the cleaning, uh, and we would uh, look to continue to partner with them and offer our after-school programs as we have done in the past. Parents are still going to need um, that support. Wonderful. And then um, I got a question. So for for teachers that have health issues and or Orange County virtual school is not going to work, they. Um, they aren't offered a position to be in the classroom alone because of the numbers and the way it shakes out. Will we be doing anything for those uh, teachers like some type of pandemic sabbatical so they don't lose time and they can come back when there's a vaccine with kind of seamlessly? I understand pay would be an issue, but would we be able to offer them something like that? Yeah, they would be covered under our sick leave policy oh. that they would, be, they would be off. Now they would exhaust their paid sick leave and then it would be unpaid. <laughs> Uh, after they exhaust it. But yeah, they get up to a year's worth of leave under our collective bargaining agreements. Okay, thank you. And then um, my last two questions, I'll put them together because they're simple. Um, how are we going to keep masks on our pre-K, kindergarten, first and second graders? I, I think our teachers are going to spend the majority of their time trying to tell the kids to keep a mask on. Um, that's going to be a struggle. And number two, progress monitoring. Will, can we get assurances that those progress monitorings will not be graded? So masks are going to be difficult, even for adults. I uh, and pre-K. Hey, we're is. not talking about masks. We're talking about the shields. shields. The shields. It's a little easier. Yeah, they'll still. It is. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, as with all things with our younger children when they're coming in, you know, many of them, that's, that may be their first experience. So they have to learn, you know, to share. They have to learn sometimes how to walk in line, personal space. So we will we'll work with them. Uh, we're also going to continue to be in, part in communication uh, both with Nemours, uh, Dr. Pino, um, as we get more information, as, as we know, Things have changed significantly in, in just a month. Sure. And so uh, that's why we said that plan is, is, has to be fluid and it will require us to evaluate and make any needed changes. Um, I, I can tell you that just today I read um, an email that one of the area superintendents sent me, and it's a teacher um, who's doing a summer camp. Work, it's not pre-K, but it's elementary level children. He thought it was going to be incredibly difficult with the mass and that he would have to spend most of his time outside. And he says that, you know, he was pleasantly surprised that the kids are keeping it on. It hasn't been difficult and it's a, it's a half day program. Uh, so it's one of the things that we will have to work with um, and monitor and adapt based on, on new information. And because then, I can envision that, you know, having a runny nose and pushing the mask down or pushing the shield up and wiping it on there yeah. or that sneezing and taking their mask so they could sneeze. Right, but we have great <laughs> teachers. Uh, and if you think about uh, the time that they spend, you know, w w at the beginning of the year and they work on routines and procedures and rules and mm -hmm. they model and this is what it looks like, this is what it doesn't look like. Um, we have phenomenal teachers that will, will be able to work on that. And then your second question, yes. Um, so progress monitoring um, is a very um, personal subject with, as it relates to a teacher. And so one, one could say that a quiz is a progress monitoring tool because you're able to assess how much a child learned for a particular unit or, um, or area of study. What I'm interpreting um, your question to be, and I could be wrong, is that if we're using a tool, like a progress monitoring tool that is looking to assess over a long period of time, I'll use iReady even though we are looking at other options, that those would not be graded. And I would say yes, we would continue to push the message that the, the PMAs, um, uh, the ones that we're going to use with NWEA, that those are not to be graded. Those are uh, to solely be used to inform instruction. And there are plenty of other assignments that can be given uh, and graded where we don't need to um, use those progress monitoring tools. Thank you. OK, last, um, last board member on this before we go to our last segment is Member Cobert. Yes, thank you. Just a, a quick thank you to all of the staff in the room and the community out there that's watching for your, your stamina in this now eight and a half hour work session with 20 more slides to go. So <laughs> very much appreciate uh, that because this is so important to the community and it is stretching out as we are continuing to get questions from the public. So I, I greatly appreciate your patience and stamina. Uh, you may not have the answers to these questions, but I want to throw them out and put them on your list as we seek answers in the next week or so. One is a, is a clear plan for volunteers. So on the one hand, that's bringing additional people onto our campus. On the other hand, they could be vital as we look to uh, supply lunches to families who are learning virtually but still need um, those meals provided. Or as a tool to, if we end up eating lunches in class to give those teachers a break. Um, volunteers could be vital to providing that break. So I think those clear guidelines for volunteers will be very important. I did have a question. I think this is pretty logical. Uh, but if a, if a student uh, chooses Launch Ed at Home for the fall and their family is comfortable with them returning to school in January, will they stay with the same teacher that they were learning with virtually? So that is one question that has come up. So there are some qualifiers there because what if that teacher wants to do something different for January? So I, I wouldn't want to commit uh, that that teacher will go to face-to-face -to -face because if the state extends, for example, um, the innovative model, that teacher might want to remain in uh, the launch ed at home model. So I wouldn't want to commit the teachers at this point. Right. 
Okay, so again, that goes back to our flexibility and patience, <coughs> and we are appreciating that partnership from the community and understanding that, that some of these will continue to be unknowns, and that we just need to be uh, comfortable with that. Um, the subject came up about uh, drills, and I just want the board to know that that is on the list for the Florida School Board Association to advocate for suspension of some of those drills, that some of that could be done with videos in the classroom instead of you know, hundreds of students exiting the building. And then finally, I am having questions about uh, pre-K and VB VPK. Um, will those also be offered virtually and with launch ed? At this time, we are proposing that that is an available model for um, all students. Again, uh, really need to look at the specifics for the plan. Um, I don't recall if it was K through 12 or if included pre-K. Um, our funding is a little bit different for pre-K. But currently, if we're allowed, yes, we would offer that uh, for our pre-K students as well. Very good. Thank you. Member Cobert, that completes your questions? Yes, it does, Chair. Thank uh, you. Uh, let me also commend you for your work with F FSBA um, in putting together the um, document that I think we've all found extremely helpful. I know it was a lot of time and effort, and we re very much appreciate um, your, your good work on that. Thank you, let Chair. Me, absolutely. Let me call on Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon, you're recognized. Let me try again. Okay. There we go. Dr. Gordon? Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay. Um, put, just put me back on the speaking. I'll ask this question, and it's a question for John, because, um, you, you, you know, as I stated before, you have listeners out there. A lot of them are parents. Uh, several of them are parents. And a lot of teachers. And with our discussion there, get confused about the pay and different things. So just put me back, and I'll try to see if I can get a good understanding here of what they are asking, because it, it's just it's confusing. Okay. Okay? Yeah, we'll put you back in the queue. Okay, so just put me half and half uh, a third Pomeranian. Place me back on the speaking order, and I would try to get some clarity on what they are trying to get because now we got them all upset because they are hearing one board member, and they're hearing another, and they're hearing answers. And down there, they, they're confused. But John, John is probably able to answer it, I'm sure. Okay. Oh. Okay, so let's do this. We're going to go proceed forward with um, the next segment. And during that segment, we also have a financial um, update. And that would be a perfect time um, to circle back and um, cl clarify and answer Dr. Gordon's questions. So, Dr. Vasquez, you're recognized. Uh, what, oh. what I will do is share the yes. day, since my people know my number is available until 3 o'clock in the morning, they all have it. So. Um, what I will do is if I get a clarity from what they're trying to get, I'll text it to John, and then that way he'll be able to have an answer or, or not, if not the superintendent or someone to be able to answer it for them. Perfect. Thank you. That'd be very Thank helpful. Thank you. Madam Chair? Yes, John? I do have an answer on the unemployment. Yes. Uh, your mic's off. Um, can is you it on now? That? So that okay. Um, continuing with the theme under 443.091 3A, mm -hmm. the time between academic periods is not compensable for unemployment comps, so you cannot pay that. Also, if you are the the money that is goes to that, it's funded. Those are funded by uh, comp or. Um, contributions that we as the employer make. So the more of our employees that get unemployment comp, the higher the contributions we have to make. But the statute's very clear, and there's case law on it, that the period in between academic terms, they are not compensable. But we're already paying them for pre-planning day. Yeah, you're paying, yes, for you're paying for- pre-planning day, which is in between academic periods, no? Yeah, no, well, yes, pre-planning is, that's, that's correct. 
I, the presumption I made from the question, and if I'm presuming wrong, I apologize. The presumption I was making for the question is, if they're not working, if we move it back and we don't have them in pre-planning, could we advance compensation or could they get unemployment compensation for days they weren't working? Okay, so I think where the board uh, members that have brought this up were coming from was that that could be professional development, which could also be pre-planning. It could be, so, so So here's the situation with yes. that. They have 197, they being the teachers, I apologize. They have 197 duty days under our contract, 180 of which are instructional days. Six days are pre-planning days, two days are post-planning days, three days are promised for the end of the nine week work days, and there's a couple more, they're, they're committed days, so there is, there would have to, we would have to go back to the unions to negotiate some flexibility into the usage of those days if we were going to do that. Okay, so it's not a hard and fast, absolutely no, but it's not looking good. Well, looks, well, we're gonna, good, we're looks, gonna, looks good is a relative term. Okay. Um, it, it's Let's, not a hard and fast no, but it would take some work. Okay, so it's a, okay, it's a possibility. Dr. Vasquez. But I also, I think, obviously, we need to hear from Dale in terms of what is the fiscal impact of that. Dr. Vasquez, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, let's talk a little bit about school clinics. Mm -hmm. uh, school health clinics are funded a school health assistant, and they typically have someone else trained um, as a designee to oversee uh, the clinic. They, <clears throat> excuse me, each clinic, area will be required to be equipped with um, daily access to personal uh, protection equipment, including gloves, masks, and face shields. They will also have uh, a no-touch infrared thermometer and uh, have direct access to a sink. Clinics will have two designated areas to serve students with social distancing. Personal protective equipment must be used in both of the rooms. One room uh, we are designating as a well room where we would um, provide triage, uh, a, tr a treatment room, um, distribution of medicine, uh, taking care of a sprained uh, ankle. The other room, the sick room, is where we would have um, students that are showing symptoms uh, of uh, COVID-19, including fevers, a cough, a sore throat, uh, vomiting, and chills. I think this froze. If the initial temperature of a student is taken and it is over 100.4, the clinic staff will direct the student to sit quietly for three to five minutes and then the student will be rechecked to confirm the reading before contacting the parent and sending them home. In addition, um, the school clinic staff will be required to participate in training they will wear personal protective equipment and adhere to social distancing to the extent possible. They will utilize the district th temperature screening with a no-touch infrared thermometer. Uh, and we've already addressed if uh, temperature is taken, it's over 100.4, uh, it will be rechecked and then the child is sent home. Do you want me to continue um, into cleaning and disinfecting, or are there questions regarding the clinic? Are there questions from the board? I don't see anyone queued up. Then let's, let's continue. All right. All right, so let's talk about uh, cleaning and disinfecting. So unoccupied areas for seven or more days um, need to be uh, periodically cleaned. Uh, and that is more of a practice that's in place currently because schools are empty. Uh, once school starts, we know that the majority of buildings are, are occupied. Uh, we will uh, reinforce cleaning practices for outdoor areas, prioritize um, disinfecting 
uh, frequently touched areas, uh, maintain all the resources and equipment that's needed uh, for cleaning and disinfecting. Uh, we're gonna reduce the sharing of common spaces and frequently touched objects, um, clean uh, dirty surfaces with soap uh, and water prior to any disinfect disinfection, uh, use an EPA approved disinfectant against COVID-19, uh, follow all label directions, and uh, keep any and all disinfectants out of the reach of children. <coughs> Next, we're gonna turn it over to Mr. Bill Wynn, who will discuss transportation. Can I ask a question? Yes, Dr. Castor Dental. <laughs> Sorry. Didn't know the protocol with different people here. Um, we're just trying to plow through. I just have a question about the, the cleaning. Yes. Can I ask about that before we get to transportation? Yeah. Okay. Um, the custodial staff, who supervises them? Is that a, a, a principal or an assistant principal, or is it a custodial supervisor? Who makes sure that that gets done? It's centralized services. Custodial supervision comes from centralized service. There's a lead custodian at the school who has oversight, and then we have uh, mid-level managers that uh, visit the schools for inspections as well. Okay, um, I, I know that that might not give enough confidence that all those surfaces are being cleaned by the people who are working in the schools. Is there another level of supervision that we could implement to really ensure that that's happening? We'll add it to the list. Okay, and there is also a question about whether teachers would be responsible for cleaning up in between classes. Um, I know students, we don't recommend students do that, but would that be added to teachers' job? So that's the collective bargaining issue that you're broaching. So need to let that go to the table. Okay. I, I will tell Currently you. Currently they I, don't, I will, right? I'm sorry. They currently do not. They are not responsible for that, but I know lots of teachers who take responsibility because they want their classroom to be germ-free. I know they've done it before, but it is not part of their job description and should, um, if it's going to be a requirement, would go to the collective bargaining table at least for a discussion. But I know we have teachers who are committed to keeping their work areas uh, clean and safe, both for themselves and for their students. Um, they don't always have the supplies to do that themselves, though. So that's, that's a whole other area of procurement of all those PPE supplies. Got it. Okay, we thank you. I believe the chair is back. Vice Chair Gould is the next to be recognized chair. Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. We only got to one section. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we have some background noise, but we can hear you. It does not sound like you're social distancing. Sorry, now. I lost my earbud. Vice Chair Gould. Can you hear me all right now? We, we do. It sounds like you're having yes. a party in the background. Yeah. Um, okay. So going back to, I'm sorry, I wanted to go back to the unemployment issue. Um, I, I understand the unemployment payment that we pay, but there are multiple uh, CARES Act programs for people who lose their wages or have interrupted wages, and that's specifically what I would like us to look into. I just didn't want to lose that. And um, I know that in follow-up to the, the safety and security and cleanliness component, I know that in the the uh, think tank uh, summaries and in some of the presentations we had talked about having places where um, there would be stations for cleaning and making sure that all those things happen. I would advocate that we have expertise on our campus that can help make sure that that education stays up and um, that we stay consistent with, with our supplies and all of those things. And that's in our school nurses and aides. And we have many registered nurses that are not working at the registered nurse level, and I would like to know the financial impact in order to convert them and if we could possibly do some kind of a differential or stipend 
for an additional duty during this period and then have that sunset. That may be more than we can answer this evening. Dr. Jenkins said we'll look into it. Her mic was not on. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, have we called on everyone here? Because I do not see Dr. Gordon's name checked off. Do, or is that to come back to, John? That was to come back to, right? Yeah. After we get clarification. Okay. So, Dr. Dr. Jenkins, are we ready to move on? I'm sorry. Member Bird, you're recognized. And Chairman, I apologize. I, I, I had asked um, them to plow through until yes. we got to a certain spot for breaking in for questions, but it sort of went off So off where track are we? I'm a little confused. Yeah, we've only covered two more <laughs> We've only covered transportation. two more sections. So we're at transportation. I apologize. We, okay. we just got off track a little. <laughs> Someone just jumped in and asked a question out of, out of the regular protocol, and so we okay. faltered. All right, so um, are we hearing from Member Bird, I guess? Member Bird, we'll hear from you. Well, first, I, it was we'll about the clinic. If you would ra I mean, it was about cleaning and disinfecting. If you would rather no, wait. No, go ahead. We're, okay. We stopped now, so go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, the uh, item, keep disinfectants out of reach of children, um, and this kind of goes to what Dr. Castro-Dennell said. Um, would that include our high school and middle school students? Because I think that they could be very useful when they leave, if, if they have to leave a classroom to get a wipe and wipe their desk, or when they come into a classroom, I think that might even be better, they wipe and clean the desk before they sit down. Um, is that a, would that be something that we'd be able to look at as opposed to keeping all of the disinfectants out of all their hands? So I think we would need to review. There's something that I remember about um, children and even using certain chemicals because we don't know if they'll have any type of allergic reaction, but certainly we'll add it to the okay. list of questions. Right. Okay, and then I just want to kind of reiterate what Dr. Castor Dennell said, and I've gotten a lot of emails about this, um, the concern for <laughs> the supplies being available the wipes, the soap, the sanitizer, um, and how we can ensure our public and our parents that that's not going to be an issue. And I like the idea of maybe having a team of people at each school. That that's their that's part of their job is to go around and make sure all that stuff is stocked, like a double a double check. You know what I mean? Some way we can just ensure that for our public. Okay. Any other questions, Member Bird? Okay, Member Gallo, is this on the same subject? Okay. I'm not taking any more breaks. Huh? Oh, Member Gordon, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't see Dr. Gordon there. You were standing in front of the thing, so I missed it, sorry. Dr. Gordon, you're recognized? Okay, give me a minute here. Okay, let me. Okay, Madam Chair. Yes, Dr. Gordon, we can hear you. He asked of this because some kind of way, um, <laughs> our, our audience is, is, is confused with the, with the COVID, and they're confused with the bargaining uh, procedures, and they're confused with the contract. And, and what I mean by that there, um, I'm, I'm trying to see how to leave this. Is there a number? See, that's why we got to communicate and talk. I mean, surveys are great, but it, it's not a it's not a, lot, it's not a human being. I told you how I had to brag on the on the ESC team for helping me out this summer and finding almost a cure for people that are calling in. And people want to talk, and um, and they're concerned about if they have COVID already, and they are working this summer because people don't want to share that openly. What they want to know what kind of days can they use, and then if they get it, what days are they going to have to? But in order to expedite this, is there a number? Our email, Dr. Jenkins, you used to set up beautiful emails. You used to set them up, and people could write up, and people don't want you to know who they, I mean, you know, some people just don't want people to know things. 
But that was a phone that somebody could call um, so that they can get the prof professional answers because they're confused out there right now, according to several of them are confused. And I keep getting the same, and it's all about um, employees. Let me try to get this stuff. If they catch the COVID, do they get TDY? Or do they have time? And I told them that these are people who probably are just tuning in because some of this have already been addressed and to ask them to go back and pick up from 12.15 to now but this is slap of faith. How, Madam Chair, Madam Superintendent, and Acting General Counsel, how in the world will the General Counsel is online to our list? What can we get our listeners to do? Because the next meeting is the board meeting. And we're going to be up there, but people still trying to find answers. So how can they get answers to their question? I'm going to defer all of the uh, questions that they are concerned about um, to you guys, and let's see what we can come up with and what Dr. Dickens can come up with that will expedite this. You recognize. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Gordon, if somebody has um, been notified um, that they've been exposed to the virus or they've contracted the virus, what they do is they contact our professional standards office. The email for that is professional standards at OCP. No, I, I know, but you remember, Dr. Dina, also, we, uh, they know that uh, that's not the uh, um, question. They need some answers. Okay, it may be family, they got family members, they are exposed. They're concerned about what days they can use because there's some understanding here today about the day. And I've, if you contact professional standards, Dr. Gordon, what they do is they have what's known as a medical ROD program, relief of duty. And so what happens is, is we put those who are needing to get tested who are our employees on relief of duty until such time as those test results come back. If the test results come back negative, then they can come back to work. If the test results come back positive, they stay on the medical relief of duty until such time as they get cleared to come back to, to work after dealing with the virus. So that would be their oh. avenue. So you, you didn't answer that before, did you? I don't think you did, did you? Um, I don't believe I answered that up until now. Okay, very good. That might answer, that answer one. So where would they go if they have questions? Because we're getting ready to, I'm sure the chairs will end sooner or later when we get through. So where would, your, where would our listeners go if they have answers? If they have questions that they need answers to? That what they would do is they would contact professional standards. So you have professional standards at OCPS.net. And also you can contact them directly 407. 317-3239. So if they're exposed at work, what, 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 where would the parents go? The parents are not working for us, we're working for them. So the question is, if parents are exposed to the virus, like, yeah, they would probably contact the health department to get further guidance. So, and then, so the teachers would have to use their sick leave, or the parents would have to use their sick leave. This is what people are wondering. They are working in our building. That's what I'm saying. And that, let me refer this to Dr. Jenkins, um, um, Madam Chair. Parents first. Let me refer this to Dr. Jenkins. Dr. Jenkins. Yeah, we have sent out, uh, Dr. Gordon, have sent out information. We will send it out again with all of that contact information for all of our employees uh, so that it is clear. Happy to send it out again. We are also, I was just um, talking to Mr. Howitt, we will also put out an FAQ document, Frequently Asked Questions, and uh, crank up, remind folks that our employee hotline is still available, which is run through our Human Resources Department. We will take care of that. Okay, but what I'm what I'm worried about how are we answering it's a heck of a 
How are we answering questions from Donkey Public, business partners, parents, teachers, and staff after tonight's meeting? Because they're still hanging online. The 4,650 something people are still online, believe it or not. So, how, how, if they have a burning question, they got to wait until you all know everybody's not going to answer that phone. You guys don't even answer when we call it. You know. What number is there a line that you could set up, Dr. Jenkins, or something that you've done in the past that could at least expedite? and get at least most of these questions answered before next Tuesday, July 17th, July, um, what is it, 14th. We will certainly work on something for uh, the public. We have something in place for employees, but we will, we will need to work on something for the public. Dr. Gordon, I don't have something for that tonight. Okay, but we need it. We need it because everybody's not um, an employee. They're, they're concerned because they have our parents employed. Okay, let me just let it be like that because people have questions and there's no way in the world we're going to be able to answer every one of them tonight. So, Dr. Jenkins, um, Got it. Uh, I know we had another board member that wanted to know um, uh, how, where should we email? questions about specific questions about the plans that we're considering and um, I, and I think Dr. Gordon's question is for those um, who want to call so if we could have both for all board members a phone number for people with questions about the plans that are being considered and questions of, and, and a way to email so there's a point of contact or a number that I think would be helpful to all of us thank you Dr. Gordon Dr. Uh, member Gallo Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I have just have a quick question. We can move on. Um, for the guidance in cleaning and disinfecting, disinfecting, and I did have to step out, so if this was asked and answered, I apologize. Um, you know, I got quite a few emails about um, the limited use of janitorial staff from last year like a lot of a lot of classrooms weren't getting cleaned um or just trash was being dumped it was just the basic because there was janitorial shortages we're going to require more janitorial staff than ever before to make sure that our that we're we're adhering to these protocols so have we looked into that and do we know what that might look like it's on the list we actually have uh, temp services and uh, custodial substitutes that we can use as well we are aware of it thank you all right shall we move on to uh, transportation mr Wynn, welcome good, e good evening everyone Transpor a bus service will continue to be available to those students who reside two miles or more from their homes where its transportation is required on the student's individualized education plan as defined by state statute or administrative rule. To reduce the minimum or to reduce or minimize contact with other students and close quarters, parents are encouraged to transport their students in their personal vehicle to and from school if they can. And to provide six feet between students on a bus would not be practical. This means the bus could only transport 13 to 26 students. At minimum, this would double the number of current buses the district has based upon our current ridership for over a thousand additional buses. But the purchase of a thousand additional buses would cost approximately $120 million. Also, when adding buses to accommodate fewer students, please also understand that it will also include uh, more drivers and mechanics to service the buses, and depending upon the number of buses, may also require additional facilities and needed to park and service these buses as well. As of July 1st, the transportation team has contacted over 100 applicants and interviewed over 40, and those 40 are going through the process of moving to the next level to go into training. Hiring bus drivers continue to be a challenge dur even during this period, as in, in addition to the district's hiring requirements, drivers must also be able to pass the Department of Transportation Medical Physical and also must have a commercial driver's license to operate a school bus. The district does provide training 
to help individuals obtain a CDL, and also training classes have been ongoing. I'll put in my shameless plug now. We are hiring bus drivers, so anyone interested in a new career or driving a bus can apply at www.ocps.net. Also, after reviewing other school district plans and discussions with health experts, as students can sit closer together uh, with a lower risk of transmitting the virus as if everyone is wearing a, a face covering or a mask. In doing so, we can probably seat two or three students uh, to a bus, so we can go up to 52 students and start from there. Also understand our ride time is relatively short, so the exposure would be limited. Next slide, please. Um, it is vital to have parental support to help minimize the spread of the virus by helping students maintain social distancing at the bus stops uh, prior to the bus arrival, and also to have face coverings or masks for their students, uh, both for the bus ride and also at school. OCPS Transportation Services will follow CDC recommendations to clean and sanitize high-touch areas on the buses. And this will be at minimum two times a day, uh, with the cleaning after the morning runs and after the evening runs. Our personal protective equipment is critical to ensuring everyone's safety and health, and drivers and monitors will be provided protective equipment, and the district will make available disposable masks available to any student without a face covering before boarding the bus. Another measure to minimize the risk of spreading the virus is that we'll open a number of windows and vents on the buses to improve circulation within the passenger compartment while transporting the students. And also to minimize the time that students spend in the aisles and the congestion, we will assign seats in order to load uh, from the back of the bus to the front, and then in the afternoons unload from the front of the bus to the rear. And this will minimize the number of students congregated in the aisles and passing each other. And finally, temperature checks will not be conducted at the bus stops as this will increase the time to load the buses and the bus drivers will not leave a student behind at a bus stop should they test over 100.4 degrees. And as Dr. Pino said earlier, with face coverings and masks, we can minimize the transmission of the virus. And next, I'd like to uh, ask our fire marshal, Bill Farhat, to come back up to talk about the COVID-19 response plan. Thank you. So the graphic you see there is a CDC guideline that we are using, and it's, uh, it may be a little bit confusing, so I'm going to explain it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The lower left would have been no community spread, and that would have been the period of time in January, February this year, where we did not have an issue. The lower right, if the, the far right portion of that, is where we are now. It's a uh, substantial spread. Uh, as Dr. Pino says, we're flattening that curve somewhat. We're starting to shift towards moderate. And that should be familiar to us of what we're uh, facing right now, what we've done. We've uh, made the changes to how uh, the education is being delivered and considering what will be in the future. It is the upper part that is kind of the area where we should focus on for a moment on the discovery of a, a COVID-infected person, what are the, uh, how to assess that risk. And frankly, there are a lot of factors that have to be considered. Uh, we will need to engage the Department of Health and we'll notify them anytime we have a COVID exposure if they aren't already aware. And the decision-making processes are fluid, and they are very situational in nature based upon location of the, where it occurred, depending on what school it was, uh, depending on what type of uh, protection was being used. If everyone is wearing a mask and everyone is distant and everyone is using good personal hygiene, it's the best case scenario, and there may not need to be much action taken. Conversely, if people are not wearing their masks or not are being close together, not following our uh, directives, it uh, could cause a catastrophic change where uh, many people would have to be sent home in isolation. Uh, so the Department of Health would give us that guidance. They would make, help us make those decisions. It's not something we would do on our own. And we cannot have a firm uh, protocol in place because we can't assess that. It requires the epidemiologist that Dr. Pino spoke to earlier who can help us assess that and make those decisions. As on the right-hand side of, the, uh, of that page, we do talk about what will happen. Uh, using launch ed to our advantage, if and, and in even the, the uh, lowest risk scenario, six students would be sent home. And as it gets worse, the instructional continuity plan would be active. Uh, next slide, please. 
So as we do now, currently, if we have an infected person that is discovered within our staff, uh, we are working with the Department of Health. We are making decisions. We have contact tracing within our organization to see who's been involved. As uh, Mr. Pomerini just spoke to, the, the perceptual standards is involved, and they make decisions on who is uh, sent home, and they communicate with the staff member formally, uh, and they send them formal information about what they are to do, they can do to become brought back. When it comes to students, uh, you know, that would be a little bit different in the sense we would use the Department of Health's recommendations on what best to do in that. Clean and disinfect thoroughly for the exposed areas is quite obvious, and uh, we have been doing that already. If you're not aware of that, whenever we have an exposure now, our custodial services staff are entering, the, they have a team that goes in and cleans afterwards so we can re-enter those spaces, because obviously if we did not do that, we couldn't use them. Um, decisions about school dismissal are, are big decisions, obviously, and we need the Department of Health's assistance in that as well. And uh, I'll move on to the next uh, slide. Risk reduction is, uh, has been spoken about already uh, prior to me stepping up here. Uh, you guys are a good culture of teaching. We'll give their teachers the tools to reinforce good habits and help them help students and, and, and remind them of what can be done to uh, minimize the risk. You know, an important point here is we cannot eliminate risk. We can minimize it with our actions. Uh, eliminating risk is a, is a great goal, but it's not realistic. We should be aware of that, that there's always going to be risk no matter what decision you make, what type of delivery uh, the education is going to be to us, to our students. Uh, so if... You know, some of the obvious things are, you know, staggering entry of walkers and car riders, control the entry points. Um, you know, obviously our high schools, you can have a thousand people walking through entry right at the uh, bell time. So we want to be managing that in a manner to try to spread uh, our students out so we aren't having uh, preventable issues occur. Uh, the signage that we've talked about previously would have to be employed. The uh, Plus the uh, teaching of that, the monitoring of that. It's going to require a lot more supervision by our administrative staff as well. They are going to have to keep an eye on our um, students and try to reinforce in our passing periods and uh, other times when uh, children would choose or typically congregate. Uh, other considerations could be re redesigning the school day, which has also been discussed. And, uh, you know, the cloth face coverings, you know, it, it is mandated now. Is something that really needs to be considered for going in the future, even if it does, the guidance does change at the county level. That's the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Jenkins. Microphone? I'm sorry. Microphone. Okay. We are ready for mental health and social emotional well being. We can cover that swiftly, as some Thank of this you. was already presented to the board previously, but it is worth a review and how it will relate in the coming months. Dr. Vasquez. Thank you. Our reentry plan will include a tiered system of support for both students and staff social and emotional well-being. We will use uh, tier one, we'll uh, the tier one support will include universal support for all. Tier two would include small group support and tier three would focus on individual support. This should be a, a familiar slide. Uh, this uh, recaps uh, some of what we did when we pivoted and what our plans are. Our district developed this plan for support and continuity of social and emotional learning during April and May. The chief academic office provided distance learning mental health resources through Canvas. Additionally, mental health helpline was established and served by district mental health counselors. In June and July, professional development to support students and staff, social and emotional learning um, is being provided. Additionally, district social workers will be available to support students in crisis during summer school. During pre-planning, a social emotional uh, learning overview will be provided for all instructional staff. This overview will show how OCPS is supporting social and emotional learning through the OCPS 2025 strategic plan, introduce the research-based framework OCPS will use, and highlight the available SEL curriculums and resources. In the first two weeks of school, we will be focused on increasing access to social and emotional learning with a classroom meeting structure through blended learning options, Additionally, school council supports, such as classroom lessons and small groups will be available for all students. 
Through the remainder of the school year, our district will support social emotional learning through uh, the four pillars, excuse me, the three pillars of interpersonal, intrapersonal, and decision making training. Uh, we will also have a district wide focus on building and supporting the school culture and climate for social and emotional learning. Next, let's talk briefly about professional development and training. All instructional staff uh, will need to take either self paced or face to face courses. Uh, on, during pre-planning on topics that include reopening the instructional models, OCPS launch ed, the instructional continuity plan for extended closures, and safety and sanitation guidelines. All administrative staff will need to take a similar self-paced course before pre-planning. Uh, classified staff will also need uh, to take similar courses, including those on safety and sanitation guidelines during the first week of school. Now I'm going to turn it over to our chief financial officer who will discuss um, financial implications and the CARES Act. There are financial implications that we must consider when developing our school reopening plan. The first financial implication to highlight is the potential decline in our overall enrollment or FTE as a result of the pandemic. Parents may use this crisis as an opportunity to explore other options for their child's education. Parents may be convinced that virtual education is the best way to go. Still, others may come back to the public school system due to educational offerings or financial considerations. The bottom line is that we're only funded for the students we have in our schools, so we must be ready to adjust our school budgets based upon the students we serve and any flexibility provided by the state. The second financial implication to remind you of is that the state funds our virtual students at a significantly reduced amount. The specific amount is dependent upon the grade level and the program of each of our students. But as an example, our K-3 basic student would receive about 25% less funding or about $1,823 less as a virtual student than they would as a face-to-face -face student. In addition, the state only provides funding for students who successfully complete each virtual course. The next implication to mention is the cost of personal protective equipment. We recently placed an order for 460 reusable masks for our students at a cost of just over $400,000. That's uh, providing like two reusable masks per student. We also placed an order for 10,000 gallons of hand sanitizer at a, at a cost of about $140,000. Orders were also made for 1,000 goggles and 1,000 face shields for staff working with specific student populations. Donations have also been secured from various sources throughout this crisis, and the state just supplied all school districts with reusable masks for staff. The cost for uh, PPE should be eligible for 75% reimbursement from FEMA and another 12.5% from the state. However, we should expect to have to absorb those costs initially since FEMA reimbursements usually lag several years. Overall, our total spend to date is around 1.1 million on PPE. Also, our facilities division has estimated the cost of classroom shields for all elementary student stations, and that's 5.3 million. No purchases have been made. They just looked into estimating the cost of that. There's also a recommended need to purchase additional electrostatic sprayers for disinfection purposes at all our schools and work locations. This will cost an estimated additional $70,000. We have some of those currently, but we need to actually add uh, about twice as many as we currently have now. Lastly, 
The option to use launch ed as an instructional delivery method was mentioned earlier in the presentation. This option would require us to purchase robotic cameras along with an iPad associated with each of those cameras. The estimated cost to purchase additional equipment is just over $1.4 million. That would be an additional 1,340 robotic cameras and those associated iPads. Next slide. The CARES Act is providing some resources specifically for education. The largest portion of dollars coming to OCPS is the ESSER dollars for K-12. We've talked about these in the past. Our 90% entitlement allocation exceeds $55 million, but after you deduct the amount that will go to charter schools and sharing equitable services to private schools, the amount remaining to support our traditional schools is $48.7 million. As we have shared before, we've also earmarked $7.9 million of those dollars for devices to complete the one-to-one -one initiative at all our elementary schools. We are also committing $2.4 million for regression intervention materials for our schools. And lastly, we are reserving an amount of approximately $38.4 million in preparation for the upcoming revenue shortfall that will impact the state budget for education in this new fiscal year that just began July 1st. While the governor just recently signed off on the budget approved by the legislature during the regular session, we must remember that that budget was based upon revenue estimates prior to the COVID-19 pandemic. Based upon feedback from state sources, a special session to adjust the budget for revenue shortfalls will not happen until after the November election. It is only prudent to reserve as much non-recurring revenue or fund balance as possible given the anticipated state budget shortfall. And some of those shortfalls are estimating, you know, it could be $8 billion. That's what we heard from Moody's and some other estimates I've seen recently coming close to that number as well. But really nobody knows what the shortfall will be. It's dependent on, you know, how soon our economy is able to recover from this pandemic. The state general revenue shortfall just for April and May alone was $1.6 billion. Also as part of the CARE Act, we have the GEAR dollars. These are the dollars that were provided to the governors of each state to use for education at their discretion. We have received our specific allocation amount for the summer recovery program. After again deducting the portion for charter schools along with sharing of equitable services to private schools, the amount remaining to support our traditional schools is $4.6 million. These dollars will be, be used to help fund the summer school program that, just, that will start next week, as well as hopefully our third grade reading camp that we had this past June. The remaining dollars will be used for other academic recovery efforts completed prior to October 31st of this year. We will continue to monitor federal legislation to see if there'll be any further federal relief for anticipated revenue shortfalls that all states are experiencing due to the shutdown of the economy. With that, I think I'll turn it back over to the superintendent. Thank you, Mr. Kelly. A couple of uh, additional notes. Um, so when, when we had the questions earlier uh, regarding doing something creative and perhaps uh, paying teachers, uh, to work earlier and having students uh, come later. This is the information I wanted you to uh, be privy to. So we have heard indication um, that even if the state decides to use their rainy day fund, it may not be sufficient to plug the hole. We simply do not know because we don't know how large that hole will be. We do know Florida's economy will not recover on the short order because it is uh, based on taxes and largely on tourism. And so we have had advisement that some of that uh, CARES Act money should be reserved for a potential shortfall. If there is a recalculation in January to make amends for a, short call, a shortfall, then in essence, um, the district would have uh, difficult decisions to make to balance the budget. So I'm a pretty strong proponent, um, quite conservative, that we ought to reserve some of that money for a potential shortfall. If we get additional federal relief, 
if the state does something different or if our economy rebounds more quickly than expected. A typical, I believe, Moody, or it may have been the um, another source suggested probably about a three-year, that was McKinsey and company said it probably would be about a three-year run to get back uh, what you've lost in the Florida economy. Nobody knows. There's no crystal ball. There's no perfect calculation. But I would submit to you that you wouldn't want to spend down all of your CARES Act money. And it has been suggested uh, among the finance officers uh, and state uh, organization that we probably ought to reserve some of it for what is bound to happen in January. That being said, um, The finance officers also asked, uh, one of the holes that we'd like to see plugged is the finance officers request that we have the same funding for face-to-face -face versus virtual funding. Because unlike um, Florida Virtual or any other virtual school, we still have overhead costs, we still have classrooms, we still have buildings. We would like to see this year equal funding for virtual versus face-to-face -to, -face to help provide some relief. There has, to this date, been no response, Mr. Kelly? Well, the, some of the information we received in yesterday's call essentially said for virtual funding, you're going to continue to be funded just like past years. So there will be that reduction unless there's some movement or change. Uh, maybe we'll get further details later, later this week. But it, it appears like virtual funding will be that reduced funding, so there, there is no help there. What we may get some relief for is for our innovation. Uh, if we do the innovative and it is approved, then they will fund that um, at the straight face-to-face -face level as well. Launch ed cameras, certainly those are tools we would like to have. As I mentioned earlier, we can run the Launch Ed at Home program with or without them. They certainly will make the classrooms more engaging. Uh, that seems like a minimal investment that I would uh, endorse. And of course, then we've committed to the additional dollars to finish out those students who do not have their laptops at the one-to-one -one level just yet. So a lot remains to be seen. Um, I am not holding out hope that we would have some agreement between uh, two houses of Congress on additional relief, certainly uh, not before the election, but we will keep our eye on all of those potential sources. I think it's prudent on our part to be careful, to be wise, to be strategic uh, about those dollars. That being said, um, for all that we have, um, I know we have questions, so I'll, I'll reserve my, my final comments, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Dr. Jenkins. Um, yeah, we have, um, I think all the board members want to comment um, and ask questions, which makes a lot of sense before we close out the evening. So let me start with Member, Lope. Member Lopez. Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to start um, with a clarification because I receive an email while we are <laughs> talking here. I think that everybody here is receiving emails over and over and over. So we receive hundreds of emails about this important topic, and I understand and I like it. I, you know, I'm sad that I cannot respond it in, in the same way that I'm receiving the email, but I think that we are facing the same situation. But I want to make a clarification. Um, when I said that I did not receive any email, um, from my constituents. I received the majority of my emails, the majority of the emails that I received from my constituents in District 2, it was against the face-to-face model, but I receive a few of of constituent a uh, few of emails that are in favor of the face to face, but it's a, a few. I don't know if the other school board members are facing the same um, situation, but you know I just want to make sure because the Sentinel already um, published something, so <laughs> they were sending the 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 comments. So I I, I want to you know to be transparent and honest that I receive a few of those. Maybe I did not use the word majority and few, so I'm, my apologies on that, on that side. And also, I want to talk about page 74, about transportation, um, because for me, is I think, I believe that the students that are using the buses will have a higher risk. Um, 
to get COVID because of this situation. I, I even when on the third um, point said social distancing, 13 to 26 students per bus on buses would not be practical because of the money um, challenges yeah, on this case and maybe because of obviously finding drivers and mechanics is, is also a challenge as well. Um, I think that um, the face covering requirement while riding can increase capacity up to two students per seat, 52 students maximum. But how much control does a bus driver have while dri you know, driving the bus? Because he can say, okay, I have 52 students, I already, um, I already put everybody on place um, based on the guidelines. But how much control, you know, how, how can we deal with that? I think that is a, a, a big, big risk. I'm, I'm thinking about my overpopulated um, schools. I know that maybe we're not going to have the same amount of students in, the, in those schools because maybe they can, they can choose. And, but um, this, uh, the, 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 the transportation and maybe we have to encourage, and, and even on, the, on page 74, he's saying parents are encouraged to transport students to and from school in their personal vehicles. I think that also we have students that have vehicles, but maybe the majority of the students that are using the transportation is because they need it. If they have the parents, maybe they don't take the, the buses. I don't know, maybe I'm thinking about the, the working families on this side. Um, I think that, uh, I don't know, uh, maybe having the buses um, transporting, maybe I, I, have I need more feedback on this matter because I think that um, we, I don't know if we can have different schedule for the bosses to avoid having so many kids at the same time in the bus. I think that is a, a risk. Dr. Jenkins. So, uh, Member Lopez, you raised some uh, critical uh, points that we might have considered some different matters before yesterday's emergency order. So you could have tried to do some creative things. I will tell you some districts actually had um, plans in place that they approved, perhaps the A day, B day, where you're trying to split your population and all the students don't come on the same day. That's not allowed now. You have to offer five days a week face to face. And so that basically sets aside those issues. And so if you know you have to offer five days face to face, we've got a couple of ways to try to decrease the numbers on the bus. One is to say, if you have the capacity, if you have the ability, please transport your own child. We would love for you to help us have some relief. If your child has to ride the bus, then they're going to need to wear a face covering. And we need parents to say to their young people that are riding the buses, got to keep the face mask on on the bus, sit down. I mean, it sort of gives a, a, a different feel to the bus when mm -hmm. students have to sit on with face masks. So we're hoping for great behavior. But if not, we have code of conduct mm -hmm. that will have repercussions for someone who misbehaves on the bus. But if we have to, we don't have the, the dollars nor the capacity to buy several more buses uh, to cut those numbers down. So we have to do the face covering, two to a seat, uh, load from the front to the back, and then, uh, I'm sorry, load from the back to the front, and then exit from the front to the back to help them not have to cross each other in the, in the aisles. We've got some strategies that will help with that, and those are basically our only choices. So we, we need help from our parents, certainly, and those that are able to transport. Mm -hmm. We need them to. Those that are not able to transport, support us on the mask, bus driver will have um, disposable masks there if the students don't come with one uh, and support us on appropriate behavior on the bus. And that, that's and where we're left after yesterday's emergency order. Perfect. Thank you. I also have another question on, on page 75. Um, need parental support for social distancing at bus stops prior to the bus arrivals and use of face covering for bus ride to reduce the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. That pairing, that would be a support um, for in that situation. It's gonna be uh, an addition. I, I believe that we, they have, you know, the parents that are gonna be helping us on this case, are they gonna do the background check the same way we have the additions and the chaperones, even if they are outside of the, of the schools and even when, because they are, they are with our children. 
So what are we going to do with, uh, in that case, if we have volunteers at front of the bus stops? So that's a great question. Actually, what we're referring to is what parents normally do. They're walking their kid to the bus stop. If mm -hmm. you are out there with your child, and I understand some bus, drop, uh, bus stops may not have any parents that are standing around watching until the bus shows up, but that particular bullet is talking about parents who are normally engaged at the bus stop because they walk their kid to the bus stop or they drop them at the bus stop. They watch until the bus comes. That's what we're referring to there. Uh, whether or not we could um, solicit uh, addition volunteers who would be willing to stand at the bus stop until the students come is sort of a sticky area. You just gave um, John a bit of a palpitation. So um, <laughs> because our supervision at the bus stop is going to be of concern. Mr. Palmarini. Uh -huh. Yeah, thank you, Madam Superintendent. Normally under the laws of Florida, we don't have responsibility for supervision at a bus stop that it so like if two kids get in a fight at a bus stop prior to our bus getting there that is something that we are not held liable for you start assigning volunteers to to monitor that then we become responsible for that on the liability aspect so yeah that is something to consider when making that decision we would assume liability that we otherwise don't have okay so um how are we going to to support or to not support the person that wants to be a volunteer on the, at the bus stop then. That's because even, even in, the, um, in high school bus stops, in middle school bus stops, we're gonna need somebody. We don't have the, you know, the, the right measurements, you know, the, the guidelines, uh, following the, the distance, the mask. How can we deal with that? And, and I don't think there are any easy answers there, Member Lopez. I can tell you what we were indicating in this presentation is that parents who typically are walking to the bus stop or hanging at the bus stop until they see their child's bus arrive, we would be uh, hopeful that they would supervise their own children and, and try to keep that distance. I don't have a solution for how we enforce it um, in large numbers uh, and assume that responsibility. It's one of the things we have to ask parents to be responsible yeah. for. I was thinking about we have certain stops that are not safe, and I'm thinking about people that can, you know, we, we cannot put our children in danger, our students. You know, well, so, so I want to be clear, we don't provide the supervision at the bus stops currently, so I don't want anyone to think this is any different. But we could yes. certainly, I'm, I'm just thinking on the spot, we, we could certainly uh, in, in some areas ask if our law enforcement professionals would sort of make sure they're passing by those bus stops. We can, we can brainstorm around um, uh, potential stops or drive-bys uh, with law enforcement or our security folks, but I can tell you we've got hundreds of bus yeah. stops. There's no way we can supervise them all. Okay. Thank and, you. And, and just one more issue on that. Yes. The placement of bus stops itself <laughs> under state law is a planning level decision that we get absolute immunity for. So we can't get sued regardless regarding where we place our bus stops. That's a planning level decision. Perfect. Thank you. I also have a, a, question, a comment on page 80. A question. Um, with the um, risk reduction information, can we have that information in different languages, in different um, social media? And also in mini videos and, you know, in a real situation, because sometimes it's more appealing for our students to see the video, people like them, you know, students in the class and what to do, what not to do, something creative. So I don't know, they can memorize what they should do. And in page 85. Member Lopez, we do have plans for that. Oh, perfect. Thank you. And the last one is on page um, 85. The parent training and support, how is going to look like? So we would look to offer that both face-to-face um, -face and provide online options uh, for families. Uh, uh, staff is um, reviewing 
distance learning and some of, not some, we, we had quite a bit of feedback from parents. Um, and some of it uh, just dealt with understanding the technology, also um, being mindful that we had two thirds of our ele elementary students who had not uh, transitioned into launch ed, um, one was getting ready. And so we would provide all of the training uh, that goes with um, the launch of a cohort for cohort seven and eight. And we would also have uh, those available uh, for them to view or review. Uh, in addition, we had the uh, uh, virtual office hours where in the names and the contacts of individuals um, that if there was a question we primarily had staff take advantage of that we we're also planning on having something similar to that for parents if they need to reach out for any type of um, technical uh, issue or we already have it in place for sel for social emotional perfect are we going to have that in different languages as well or not we will Look at the the paper or um, the documents are very easy to translate. Uh, the trainings we can look at translating as well. Perfect. I'll make note of that. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Member Member Lopez. Let's go to Member Castro Demo. All right. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> uh, my my questions. Are a compilation of different topics, so bear with me. Um, I have a question about the resurvey of parents, and you may have already thought about this, but I just want to make sure that I'm sharing my thoughts. Um, if we could please have a different format of the survey um, instead of the connected, um, maybe do a survey monkey or something that is simple for everyone to use. At and that we can um, maybe use some drop-down menu items to give some more information. I know that parents, um, it would be helpful if we knew what their concerns were, uh, their preference for the instructional model, maybe even rank order their preferences. Um, and then, of course, include the school and the student grade level. In, in those it might help us to plan. Yeah. And also, if we can include what their need is for transportation. I know we know what kids use the buses, but maybe we, we can push their, the idea of if they could walk, would they? If they had a, someone with them, like a walking school bus, or are they able to find a carpool to help us with that? And then for teachers on their survey, if they could also rank order their preferences for which model. And sorry, my writing. Um, and also possibly include what, what teachers believe their training needs are now that they know what our options are. Um, a second issue is about masks and if not if students are taking them on or off during the school day, but what if a parent says, my child will come to school and my child will not wear a mask? I see Mr. Mr. Palmerini is about to answer. Yeah. Thank, you, uh, Thank you, Madam um, mm -hmm. Chair. Member Castor dental the regulations of health, safety, and welfare are amongst the widest powers that you all as a local government have. Um, the United States Supreme Court just actually talked about health, safety, and welfare regulations in the uh, midst of this pandemic. It was a case called South Bay United Pentecostal versus Newsom, and it was limiting the number of people in a church for a service because of health concerns. And the court said the precise question of when restrictions on particular social activities should be lifted during a pandemic is a dynamic and fact intensive matter subject to reasonable disagreement. Our Constitution principally entrusts the safety and health of the people to the politically accountable officials of the state to guard and protect. So they give you all a wide variety to regulate um, health, safety, and welfare. It's my opinion that if somebody says my child's coming to school and you, they're not going to wear a mask, I think we can say, no, 
for you all to come for you to come to school in order to protect the health safety and welfare not only of that child but of the other children and the adults in the room that we're going to require you to wear a mask and if you don't want to do that we have other options available if the innovations option uh, is approved by the state or the virtual option is approved i think we can say that to a student and their parent all right thank you i would like to submit that we say that um, another question is about substitutes. And I don't know if uh, we've been in contact with Kelly Services, and I'm sure you, someone has, but um, I don't know if those substitutes are also trained in the protocols for each school where they may be needed, um, and if we have enough to cover when a, a teacher is. Uh, quarantined or has to leave because I know it was a it was a problem in the past making sure that we had adequate substitutes can you respond to that yes we have been in conversation consultation with Kelly services in fact you might recall uh, they provided um, all of the substitutes that we needed to help run our grab-and-go program uh, for our students uh, over the summer uh, also, some additional support as needed. They've done temperature screenings for us in uh, uh, our first trials. And so Kelly Services is a, is a fairly reliable partner. The training that will be necessary for them has been discussed as well. Not all completed, but certainly in those discussions. All right, thank you. Yeah, they would need to have that, the uh, swivel training and all that. Okay, that's a lot. Thank you. And safety, yeah. Um, another question is, uh, I didn't hear enough information to satisfy parents, at least, of what is the difference between Orange County Virtual and Florida Virtual? So it's on a couple of the, no, no. Orange County Virtual versus Launch Ed is on the slide. Orange County Virtual is a franchise of Florida Virtual, as Greg is probably approaching. Keep in mind, Florida Virtual hires um, is a fran is a statewide. Uh, some people called it the 68th district. Um, they are a statewide and hire their teachers from a larger geographic pool. Orange County Virtual is basically more of our local contingency and run by Orange County Public Schools. It keeps the resources uh, and the teachers and the dollars here locally. Uh, and actually, Mr. Moody is at the table now. I'll let him further delineate. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Good question. So, Dr. Jenkins pretty much summed it all up. The the um, the similarity is we use since we are a franchise of Florida Virtual, we actually use their their uh, learning management system, their LMS for their, and we use their content and courses. Um, so that's about the only thing that, w that was left out. Okay, so they're virtually, pardon the pun, the same. Um, as far as w what a student might experience, they log in, they, they operate similarly, they find out what the content is, the lessons are kind of structured the same. It doesn't look much different. Is that right? That would be correct. I would say the, one of the, some of the differences, as Dr. Jenkins pointed out, would be um, we have Orange County teachers teaching. Um, traditionally, uh, prior to COVID, uh, uh, Orange County Virtual has, a, has an actual campus off of Silver Star Road where we are able to provide additional support and work sessions for, for students to come in on campus to, prov uh, to have work sessions, to have uh, consultations with teachers, uh, to have parent, teacher, and student conferences, uh, and to have uh, additional support provided um, on campus. So we'll have to look at that, what that may look like uh, with COVID and, and some of the restrictions related to uh, social distancing, but I would expect us to work through that, uh, those questions about what would that face-to-face uh, -face and unique support that Orange County Virtual provides that uh, uh, another provider may not be able to, to do. Right, I can, I can see the benefit. I, my, my 
kids have also enrolled in Orange County Virtual and Florida Virtual. And if I can make one recommendation um, versus the benefit of Florida Virtual for us was that it had a flex option, which allowed um, my students, my kids, to kind of work at their own pace longer or shorter than a semester. Same content, but at their, really at their own pace. And if Orange County Virtual could offer that flex schedule, uh, we would have gone with Orange County Virtual. So that might be an option to add to Orange County Virtual so that you're not losing students to Florida Virtual unnecessarily. Yes, ma'am. Yep. <laughs> Just an idea, if you're able to. Was, was that uh, home ed flex? It was full-time flex, full -time flex with Florida Virtual, which interestingly, my, my kids ended up taking an Orange County Virtual taught class through flex. I don't know how it all works behind the scenes, but that's something you could look into. I'm sure mm -hmm. the principal um, is very familiar with that. Um, I have another question. Sorry. Um, it has to do with the, the commissioner's order that we have to offer five days a week in person, but it doesn't sound like offering a hybrid model is excluded. Is it possible to offer a fourth option? So logistically, I don't know that we could weather that. What you'd be saying, the reason we would have wanted to look at uh, a hybrid A day, B day, so that you're splitting your population in half is because that's a way that you can manage the population. Well, if the rule says I have to offer everybody five days face to face, and then I also try to offer this A day, B day, logistically, I'm creating quite a mess because I can't insist that parents choose A or B. So I have no way of knowing who wants to have five days face to face. Someone said, if my child's going to be exposed two days, then why not expose them five days? And I've got a job and I have this issue. All of those things would enter in, but logistically, for the principal to try to manage going and coming A day, B day, plus those who are supposed to be there five days, plus those who are going to be doing the launch ed, logistically, it would be nightmarish. Um, I don't know that we can manage it, nor that we would be able to financially plan for it if I have to offer five days face-to-face -face for everyone. It, it, it's messy. It's complicated. I, un I understand that it's messy and complicated, but I also see the value in um, the classes offering the, the, met, the, the format that you are putting together for the A day and B day schedule. It still socially distances and it allows uh, the right class no, it, size. It doesn't if you have to still have five days offered face to face. Then that would cannot, be another model yeah, you can't within the school. No, no, no. Oh, you can't just offer A day, B day. You have to offer five days face to face for everyone, no matter what. That will that could go still away. be an offering, is what I'm saying. It, I think it's a semantics thing. They're offered four choices instead of three. We'll take a look at okay, it. Okay, thank I don't, you. I don't think it's feasible, but I don't know that we're communicating clearly. I'll talk to you. Maybe okay. it's just getting late. Okay. Another topic that I don't, I didn't hear addressed, um, but it's been a long day, so it could have been um, eating in the classroom. That has been brought up. Uh, as a concern by a lot of teachers when you're trying to maintain a, a um, reduce the spread the whole day and then you're allowing them to eat in the classroom. There's a, a lot of teachers that are having a problem with that. Hmm. And maybe a, an op, uh, a solution would be to allow the cafeteria monitors who are normally in the cafeteria when the kids are eating just to take them outside, space them out, picnic style, and then they're not bringing it back into the classroom with their, while they're eating. Just an option. Happy, happy to look at it. There are issues with that as well. First issue is personnel. You do not have enough um, cafeteria workers. 
I also think that there'd be an issue with um, the contract because that's not part of their normal duties, so we would have to impact bargain. Um, I have not heard um, that uh, it spreads. I've heard concerns that teachers would not have their planning time, but everything that we've heard, including from Dr. Pino, is that less movement is what they encourage. Um, and so at the elementary level, many schools, that's the option that they're using for lunch, is that instead of having children traveling back and forth, they're keeping them in the classroom. But I'll certainly um, research as you know, information changes daily. OK. My final um, comment uh, has to do with where parents and teachers can get more information or ask questions. And it is apparent to me that the parents and teachers in my district know how to get a hold of me. And all of us, I know we all had so many emails and phone calls and Facebook messages. But um, I want to just continue to allow anybody who needs to get in touch with me about a question um, or an idea to continue reaching out. It, that's fine. It, I learned a lot throughout that process. So thank you. Thank you, Member Kester Dental. Um, let's go to Member Gallo. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you, Member Kester Dental, because you, you asked several of the questions that I was going to ask. So I, I appreciate that. Um, just to echo <clears throat> the last sentiment from Member Kester Dental, um, I, I agree transparency is so important. And I've received messages this evening from parents saying, um, and staff and teachers, um, thanking us for this very long work session and asking us to please keep it up and, and, and to please continue to be transparent um, because they just, it's scary. We've all received hundreds of emails and I haven't been able to read every one of them. Um, I'm still working on it. It's just very hard to keep up with. But the ones that I have, and I have read many, I can sense how scared our teachers are. I can sense how scared our parents are. I mean, they're truly frightened. We're True. living in very frightening times. And mm -hmm. so, you know, when we go back to, to talk about flexibility and compassion and grace, I mean, we really have to operate under those guidelines and make sure that we're being as flexible as possible and we're, we're considering all scenarios and we are offering grace because I think that that's most important um, during this time. And I'll echo uh, Member Kester Dental, please continue to email me. I'm learning a lot. It's important for us as a board to understand what your fears are, um, what your ideas are, what you can um, and can't live with. I've received many emails from teachers that said, if I have to go back to the classroom, I can't go back. Um, so I am extremely concerned about the teacher shortage um, and our ability to get subs in a classroom. So along those lines, will we be flexible? Will we be looking at ulterior um, solutions for for teachers that want to stay home with their kids because they don't want to send their kids back to school they can teach their class from home but they necessarily can't teach it from a classroom setting will we look into those scenarios so we don't lose good teachers we continue to educate our kids um, and we're being as flexible as, as we possibly can that it no i have more i'm waiting okay. for the answer we will look at every possible scenario. Keep in mind we have been constrained by that latest order, but certainly happy to look at every potential scenario. Thank you. And then I, um, I have a question about um, the clinics. If, if a child is present with symptoms, a fever, cough, whatever, um, will they all be isolated together? I got a cons a, an email from a parent that was concerned that their child who may have strep, which is contagious, might be in an area with a child that may or may not have COVID, and then they more be more susceptible to that. So how are we going to isolate all students separate from one another? They would still be distanced in uh, the clinic area. Both are contagious, as you mentioned, so they would need to be distanced and they would have face masks on. Thank you. And then um, yeah, I'm trying to read my writing. Give me a second. Oh, I, um, would it be possible for those teachers who desire it to make 
um, as much as the training possible online prior, the professional development training possible um, online prior to pre-planning. Um, and then there was a question about Canvas, if we will still be using it. And if, and if not, will we be training on it? So we did offer um, uh, online training and paid um, and, and to pay the teachers uh, during uh, the month of June. Certainly we can look um, at the dollars that are available to see if we can extend that into July. Currently, we have all of the trainings that were available during our uh, pivot are still available um, on on launch ed through Canvas. We will and we will continue to use uh, Canvas. Uh, that that has been uh, a very effective platform for us. Um, and again, we have cohort training for uh, teachers in cohort seven and eight that was also offered this summer. Uh, we also extended it to any new teachers who may have been at a, a new to a school that uh, arrived after their cohort um, had the training. So we will continue to provide and post um, all of the virtual learnings, and uh, we're phasing in the face-to-face. -face. We've had a few face-to-face -face trainings, um, and t as you mentioned, teachers are very apprehensive. Uh, about uh, coming in. We've had a few for our uh, preparing uh, new principals. Uh, and so we'll, we'll continue to um, offer both, but we know that currently the online option is much more attractive. Thank you. And then um, I'm assuming the launch ed, like for our IB students, if they choose to stay home and use launch ed, that, that will be kind of seamless. They'll be allowed to do so. Through Launch It at Home, yeah. yes. Okay. And I do have a response. Um, virtual does not offer um, Cambridge, but they do offer the dual enrollment and they do offer the um, advanced placement. And Greg's other item. I'm sorry? Greg's other ain't. Oh, and Greg, did you want to? Yes, ma'am, if I could. Uh, Castor Dental, you asked about uh, Florida Virtual Flex. I just want to, and I made a comment that I just want to make sure that the general public is aware. Um, we too, Orange County Virtual, also allows students flexibility and finishing a course. So if I, like for example, my child took a course uh, during the summer and was able to finish it in a couple weeks, um, one of the courses. Uh, and, but also a course may take more, a semester course may take more than a semester. So we may have students taking a, a, a U.S. government class, that's a semester class, into uh, the spring when, when they started in, in August. Now what we do is, uh, and part of uh, what I think is our benefit, is we will uh, coach students and parents, and we will monitor students' um, engagement and the content. And within the modules to make sure that they are staying because within the modules is a kind of a timeline you sh in October you should be here in the module right so if we see a student falling behind we will absolutely engage with that parent and that student about you need to catch up you need to catch up uh, but also offering that support so I, d I, I may have said something may have misconstrued but we also, like Florida Virtual, have uh, flexibility on start and finish of, of a course. Member Gill. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and my last final thought, or I'm, I've got a question and a final thought. Um, we're getting a lot, a lot of um, emails about like meet the teachers and curriculum nights. Obviously, those are going to look far different than what they have in the past. But if there's a way to do like meet the teacher virtually, um, especially at the beginning, uh, <clears throat> I am a proponent of looking at a later start date if possible. I know that the South Florida is in different phases that we are in Orange County, so they will be allowed to start later than uh, what we will be able to do. And I know that um, Superintendent Runcy has come out and basically said that, that they locally will be making de the decisions. The state won't. Um, and I, I believe um, Superintendent Dunn in Miami has echoed some, echoed some of the sentiments. And so I understand that they're in different phases. So when we, when we look at putting together frequently asked questions, when we look at, at addressing some of these issues, if we could just make it very clear 
um, why we are starting when we are. And if there is room and we are, if we can bargain or look at it, I would definitely support moving that start date so that we could be more prepared as long as it's not an undue burden on parents who are expecting us to go back on the 10th. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's go then to um, member, uh, Dr. Gordon. Dr. Gordon? Going back because I'm still getting questions in reference to the transportation. So I'm going to ask again if um, everybody doesn't have internet connection. But I wish that the transportation information, since the majority of our students are transported when we go back to brick and mortar. <clears throat> So I really, they're asking back and forth, and I'm reading all the pages again, and all the answers are there. So even though um, we have maintained the 4,658, they seem to be hanging in there, but I think um, <clears throat> they're gathered together somewhere in groups, and they, they have these concerns. But those questions that they're asking, a lot of them have been answered some kind of way, and they may have to have taken a break and go somewhere, but they are concerned about those students. And I did explain that we did have social distancing on the bus. And Dr. Jenkins did an excellent job when we first threw this out and had that long discussion previously before the pandemic really got out of hand about uh, the temperature check and uh, assigning the seat. So I know that's a major concern right now of people not wanting to spread and not wanting to catch. But those were not my questions. My questions are these. It's the financial implication. And I'm very, very concerned. And I think you've heard me say this before, mainly the a couple of board members, probably Ms. Colbert and Ms. And Mrs. Um, Pam Gu. I'm very concerned, and I mentioned this to the superintendent, and I'm saying it for the record, because evidently it's falling on deaf ears. Our minority, okay, and women business enterprise. I know that they do a great job, but I'm concerned. I've been getting a lot of calls from minorities and women wanting to be a part of our procurement. I do remember asking Mr. Mars, I know that he had put up, we used to have a lot of stuff on the website. It is so much on there now on the front page. I don't know how anybody can find a job if they have a small business. I am concerned about our minority and women business enterprise and our small business with minorities. We used to call them in. Pam School uh, has left okay. the meeting. Okay, we used to call them in and help train them so they will know how our procurement process is handled. Uh, several called me the other day, and I referred them in because I didn't know them, and I asked them not to call me again because I tried to stay out of procurement issues. I don't even know the architects by name. I really don't. I didn't know the company. I don't try to get to know anybody. But that build schools and do anything for us, I thank them. I'm very pleased to them. I wouldn't realize, recognize them if I saw them in the street, and they probably wouldn't recognize me. I'm saying all that to say this. I'm concerned about it, about small businesses getting a piece of the pie. I find that the financial implications, we approved at our last board meeting, or either the board meeting before that, the personal protective equipment, the PPE, of over 1.1 million. There were several people that had called in 
I called for service and told them to be on standby. Has joined the meeting. Because people from other areas were complaining about companies we were hiring. They were not a company of diversity, and they were just hiring people so that they could get the contract. I really do not want us to fall back after we have gone through the DJ court. I don't want us to fall back into the vestiges of hiring and giving contracts to all white businesses. When they don't have any minorities, we used to even ask them to bring in their staff. There's a lot of money out there. You, you, we just got to talking between the financial implications and the CARES Act, over $101.9 million that's in here. Some of it we have already approved the spend, but I'm very concerned about diversity. I'm very concerned about the procurement procedures. And one company, I went, oh, I did what the people asked me to do. I did what the whistleblower at that time asked me to do. And lo and behold, it was pretty much like they said, and it wasn't just a disgruntled. You could see how that company set up their website to make you think. But I think we ought to do our due diligence, but especially now when these small businesses are closing and hurting. You must remember, these are our parents. And after a while, the teachers, we're going to all be there. They just text me a minute ago and said they got their clients. But the main thing is we have got to be fair to small businesses. All the big businesses can't get this $100 million. And I know it's going in regression and reserve and shortfall and all that stuff. But I, 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 I see where we are headed back down the same line. We're not paying attention to diversity in our procurement purchasing. And if I'm wrong, please bring it to me. And I will more than likely show you a whistleblower that has asked us to do these companies that walked away with millions. We're spending a million on cameras. I do hope that there is a small business in there somewhere. We're spending 70000 on players. I pray that there is a minority women business enterprise in there. I pray that you have worked very closely with our MWBG to see if we have qualified people. And in the midst of this pandemic and people are losing their business, I hope that OCPS staff are training our parents that may have these small businesses and don't know how to run with the big dogs. We are buying shields. $5.3 million in shields. Lord, about, I haven't seen that one. The only one I've seen it so far is the PPE. And I did my due diligence on that, and I'm very disappointed. And I, and I expressed that, but it was already going through. And I know how the urgency is. We have got to keep our eyes open for this. Somebody's making a mistake. And we don't know why all this is coming up and why so many things are being demanded. I know that people are saying, get this drug, get that drug, get this. And people are walking away. We don't know what this is in our children. And the reason why I'm saying all that, all of a sudden this money shows up, but yet money couldn't show up in the nation for salary. Now, the governor did let some money show up. For, for a beginning teacher, but he didn't say anything about the stupid third year, a uh, fourth year, a uh, fifth, or uh, whatever in the middle, and let alone the top of the salary scale, you know. So I, I got a problem with, with, with this, and I know I heard Dr. Jenkins talk about the shortfall and what we need to do, but we need to sit down at the board and see what we are calling a shortfall. What is the shortfall? 
Because when these people lose their jobs, the small businesses have already lost their jobs. So we don't we don't know the education field will be next. If we don't plan this out correctly, the educational field, NEA already wrote it up about how many millions of teachers will be losing their jobs this year. From the state of Florida all the way out to California. So I think we need to look at the statistics of where we are going. Nobody's making it lucrative to come in and teach. Teachers are being told to do dust and dust. They want everything taken care of by the teachers. We, we have to clean up, mop up, pop up, cook, make sure. And then now they're asking us possibly to just stay in the classroom all day. There was a time when we did that. There was a time when we did that. I could remember, but um, my, my concern right now is, is this uh, 101.9, I may be off by a couple of thousand, but I'm, I'm concerned. I think the board needs to look into where it's going, look at the company. We can't tell you what company to get. And we can definitely tell you to follow our policies and look out for diversity. And I see we are following right back in. If we bought cameras from this particular company, sprayers from this particular company, then I don't know what kind of bid was put out there, and I don't know how many, uh, how many uh, minorities or small businesses have applied. But we really need to reevaluate that, and I wanted to make that point and make that very clear. So I would like more on the CARE Act with the, with the um, 7.9 million with the, the devices and where they are going, those eight cohort devices, and then the regression intervention, the 2.4 million. I'm concerned about what is the regression, who is regressing, uh, how far down are we regressing, and then the reserve. So that's 38.4 million in the reserve. So, I mean, I know what's happening, but this just amazed me. And I, I've been on this board 20 years, and I keep hearing the reserve. And, and, and we, we've asked for so much. I, I don't know how you all going to be able to ask for any more. I wish you well. God knows I do. And I'll probably be trying to back you or whatever you ask for in the future. But I know other people are going to be asking too. But I do know that your main, your main group is being overlooked. Your, your small businesses are being overlooked. Your MWBEs are being overlooked. Your, 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 your whole workforce is being overlooked. From administration all the way down. All the way down to your paraprofessional. We're being overlooked. And now you give us a, a 80 page, what is it, 80 pages for us to make a difference. And then we sit up here and talk about regression and shortfalls and, and, and what you are requiring of the workforce to do. I heard Biden put it very well. It's good to call everybody essential and that we may be needed. But it's good, too, that we have to look after the mental health and social and emotional well-being of our workforce. And our workforce that will be working with the parents, children, I will go to the top, the administration, your professional people in the middle that help and feel that feed back down, your instructional and non-instructional staff. I put it like that. Now, all this money coming in, going out to these doggone vendors, millions of dollars, that's why I be mad with the architects when they walk in. You're going to come in, get anywhere from 30 to 58 million, or 60 to 100 million, and then, and then you walk in with one plan. Not in my district. How are you going to come in with one plan and tell us what you're going to do? No, we're paying them. 
So I, I would like to see diversity. I would like to see the NWBE. They used to be very vocal. I'm, I'm not no reflection because I know the person that runs it very well. But I just haven't heard from the minority and women. Business enterprise, the women used to come before the board. The small businesses are begging. And I don't know who's listening. But if you all could bring me a list of small businesses that we are working with in this area that, that can help us get the cameras and the sprayers and the shields, I bet, I bet just like our students use those 3D machines, I bet they can create and come up with something ourselves. So I don't know. I'm, I'm just a little disturbed about the financial implication and where it's going and how it's being used. I, you know, nothing here for salary and um, for people that's your workforce. What, what, where, where is the appreciation for your workforce? We didn't even get to do appreciation day in May like we always do. So that's my piece, and I rest it. Thank you. Thank you. Member Gould? Vice Chair Gould, are you still Thank with you. us? There you uh, go. I am. I am. I had to get off of mute. Sorry. <laughs> um, I, this is a question for Mr. Kelly and the uh, financial slide. In the $38.4 million, was the adjustment to our local one millage also included in that? That is... No, that is strictly the uh, federal grant that's coming coming to our district. That's part of the 90% entitlement dollars that comes to us as part of the CARES Act that f flows through the state. That has nothing to do with the, we'll say, the overall challenges in our operating budget for this year. That's just really focused on how we're planning to use the CARES Act dollars in the district. Right, but you were saying that you thought we should keep, uh, wasn't that the amount you wanted to keep for uh, the rainy day fund in case of the shortfalls based on projections? So those projections, did they include our local one mill? No, those projections are really looking at the FEFP dollars that are coming from the state, which is both state resources as well as your normal RLE local millage. It would not include the special millage, no. As far as the... Okay. okay. So a follow-up to that. I know in previous board meetings, uh, we and when we were talking about the budget, we were talking about what might happen with flexibility in the reserve. Have we gotten any indication on um, how far we can legally dip into reserves, if so required to, in the next 24 months? There was questions that were posed to uh, Tallahassee from the finance officers group with regard to whether there would be any relief from the requirements within statute, and they indicated there would not be any relief, so we have to continue to comply with statutes relative to our, our fund balances that are uh, assigned and unassigned. Wow, this is such a rock and a hard place because on the one hand, we're, we're faced with mandatorily going back to school with the face of the pandemic. And if we don't, we dramatically affect our own income stream and revenue because it will reduce sales tax, it will reduce our one mill, and we already know, based on the projections from statewide, and they're still early, um, if there's going to be a reduction in the state revenues, even though they don't want to announce it till after the, the election. There's just no way around it. So it, it really is a, a very tough thing that we're doing. and and. You know, again, safety and security is always first and foremost, but there's safety and security on both sides of this, this health care issue for our, our families and for the well-being of our students so that they can thrive instead of just survive and have poor curriculum. Um, I, I switching subjects a little bit, um, we... 
Will we rely on the county to notify families um, if we have someone suspected of COVID, or will we participate in that contract case uh, tracing and notify the class or the the school, depending on the situation and the guidance from the county? How how do we see that communication going out to families? And, and before you answer, the reason why I ask is we have a lot of fear out there right now, and the trust that we build will be very, very important that we let people know in a timely manner that they or their students were exposed. Dr. Jenkins. So there will be a process in place. There's a process in place currently. The county health department takes the lead, but we consult with them and work together around notification and who needs to be notified. Contact tracing um, essentially is directed by the County Health Department, Dr. Pino. Right, and in follow up to that, I think constant communication and reinforcement is gonna be important. And Dr. Pino is very trusted across the county. And perhaps he would offer you know a daily message or a weekly blog especially for our families and our staff and our volunteers um that that could just keep that communication open and and help to build that confidence that we are absolutely on top of this in any way humanly possible because uh, i think that's going to be really key is the transparency and that that open line of communication um, have we, do we have a plan for training our um, partners in ed and our volunteers and additions and all the extra people that really help our students to succeed? Because they are an extension of our workforce even though they're not paid. <laughs> so, yeah, we have annual training for those groups already. We will certainly add uh, anything uh, regarding the pandemic to their training as well. Okay, and have we taught, I know we've been talking to our healthcare partners who have been, you know, wanting to support us in whatever way that they can, but have we talked to the partners at large and really opened up to our community to say, you know, we need things like PPE and um, can we get some of the county PPE that they have been able to get uh, and, and maybe have that donated and, and build some of those separators that we might want on the buses and in these other locations so that we can squirrel away as much of those dollars as we can and also really engage our community in a meaningful way. Directed, I think we should design everything, but if we put plans out there, it's amazing what people will do, just like we've seen with the CDC mask uh, templates. They, that's on wildfire across the country. So um, how are we leveraging our community to support us? So our community has been extremely supportive. The county has given us some of their PPE. Uh, we've gotten uh, resources from both philanthropic and government entities, uh, and we'll continue to leverage that. In fact, um, uh, we had several of our partners and supporters reach out to us to ask how they could help, and that is how we got so many of the hotspots provided for our families who would not otherwise have had internet connectivity. And so we are leveraging uh, that, and the county government and others have been helpful to us as well. We will continue to do so. Okay, that, that completes my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Member Bird. Thank you, Chair. Um, first, I just wanna say, uh, commend our staff that is still sitting out here in the audience. I feel so bad for you guys in Arabia back there. Hi, honey. <laughs> I didn't even get to say hello to you. Um, wow, you guys are awesome. So, um, okay, I'm gonna try to just run through these quicks. I don't need answers for everything, but I, some things I just wanna put out there so we can um, think about it. The swivel technology, um, 
for the uh, in the launch ed in classrooms, will that have a separate mic or will it rely on computer microphones and in the classroom from the teacher? And will it? Do we know if that will pick up voices behind a mask? <laughs> so. Um, it's a two-part question. The marker that you wear around your neck does pick up audio, which transmits to the iPad through the app. Um, but in addition to that, we recently put out um, a memo to schools explaining how the audio enhancement that we already put into classrooms as a part of the Launched Ed program will adequately amplify the voice of a teacher in um, a classroom when they're wearing a mask. Um, in addition to that, that audio enhancement can also transmit that sound because it's through the whole room like this. It would pick up on a recording. So both are true. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, and I have a question about pre-K VE classes. We have several, and I know I have several in my district. Um, so I'm wondering how those will look or if if they're going to be provided these same options or will they have to mostly be face to face or what are your thoughts on that so currently we are looking at offering all options uh to uh the vast majority of our our children um, i suspect that those that have disabilities um, especially those that are more severe uh, may opt if, to stay home just because of the health um, issues associated with that. Many of our pre-K programs, uh, children um, are not as severe and uh, if parents are there to support, could um, benefit from the uh, virtual or the launch ed at home. But that, that's an area, uh, to be perfectly transparent, that we are going uh, to monitor very closely and that uh, we will probably uh, tweak because we want to make sure that we're providing um, the best for them with all of the various um, services. And it's very unknown, not only because they're so little, but because they also then um, have the disability. But yes, we, we currently plan on offering it to all. OK. Um, I just wanted to kind of throw out my two cents on the temperature monitoring. Um, I'm still not convinced that I know. I mean, I agree with Dr. Pino. I don't think it's a great idea, because I don't understand how we're going to get 1,000 high school students through the front door, spaced out in a reasonable amount of time and check temperatures. I, I just don't know how that's gonna happen. And I'm wondering, I know I had sent um, the superintendent some information on thermal imaging technology where they can, the camera can monitor all large groups of people coming in at one time and check temperatures that way. Um, something like that might be more reasonable. I know there's a cost involved, of course, but I just, I don't see how, that's going to work, and that's not something you have to really answer necessarily tonight. But, and the, I have another concern with the partitions that we that you had brought up some pictures of for elementary. Um, my thought on that is that's more surfaces that need to be cleaned. But that's just my opinion. Yeah. Um, um, the other thing I wanted to talk about: Have we thought anything about? I think I heard you mention UV lights, um, and are we? Are we addressing air filters, the replacement of air filters and air cleaning um, devices? And the reason I bring that up is because I um, got an article today that said that yesterday a whole new group of research came out that goes against everything Dr. Pino said about those droplets not being aerosol. That now they're thinking uh, like 250 scientists sent a letter to the H. Um, WHO saying that they think this is far more aerosol than they thought originally. So my question is, are we looking at replacing those air filters and air cleaning devices for the schools? And that's something we can just load out there and keep in mind. Um, 
I have a question about OCVS for teachers. Um, if a teacher goes to OCVS, they still have all the benefits of a district teacher as far as union, okay, um, policies, everything. It's just like they're a classroom, a regular traditional school teacher? Yes, ma'am. There's actually an appendix in the back of the contract that deals with the specific um, job requirements with respect to Orange County virtual teachers, but that's collectively negotiated um, with our unions. And so, yeah, but they still have all the benefits of being an Orange County uh, public schools teacher. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip that one. Um, this is a question for you, John. What kind of liability do we face um, concerning COVID as far as illnesses, people contracting, um, or even worse, something more serious happening to somebody within our school system? The liability question is going to be very interesting because what you're going to have to do is that it would be a wrongful death action and you would have to prove that somebody certainly caught it in our facilities from somebody that's in our facilities and that we probably knew about it and didn't take proper remedial action and it caused them to get sick. That's going to be a hard case to prove. I, I will never say any case is impossible to prove because weird stuff happens all the time in courts, but I would think it's going to be a harder case to prove uh, in order to affect, affect us with liability on that. Okay, thank you. And did we cover, I don't know if this was covered or not, it's been a long time, but workman's comp, did you, did you talk about that? If a, if a teacher gets COVID while they're teaching? I think we did cover this, I'm sorry, I might have missed it. You know, what I know about workman's comp is enough to make me very dangerous in this forum, so I would like to look that up okay. and get you a, an answer that would be complete and talk to some of our comp folks rather than give you that answer. Okay, that's fine. Um, I wanted to kind of clarify the hybrid idea that um, I think a couple of my board members have brought up about op offering a fourth option, and um, I'm thinking... In addition to offering the full five-day option, which we're required to do, could we not offer a um, hybrid launch ed where I'm thinking um, to help with those high school electives and the middle schools that it might be more difficult, maybe they could take their core classes in the morning at school and then go home to do virtual elective classes. Is that something we could look at offering? can yeah member bird they can do that now through ocvs mm -hmm. okay but it's not something we can do through the launch ed necessarily i don't think so uh, happy to look into it i don't think so okay um and 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 i and i also want to check with my state contacts because what i don't want to do is submit a plan that then gets turned down we we know that the launch ed at home will pass the checklist. I don't want to turn in a plan that has launch ed at home plus another potential hybrid and the plan gets turned down and we're back to square one. So let me check my resources as okay. well. Sounds good. Um, in the, I know that we talked about the CARE Act and having that reserve fund, I'm looking for Dale, having, um, keeping some of that money in reserves and that makes total sense to me. But um, I also think that there is a need for a few things. And one of the things um, that I think we've kind of mentioned a little bit, but uh, could we use some of that funding for hiring extra custodial staff um, so that we could have more people on the ground at each school for cleaning? And the nurse situation, I think we kind of mentioned that a little bit earlier, having a nurse at every school. Is that something that we could maybe look at using some of that money? I know that it's important to save, but that's something that I still think that we should be looking at, if that's possible. There may be some limitations on actually hiring personnel because those are supposed to be recurring costs, unless you're just hiring them until this money runs out. So, Which for the custodian teams could be, at like a temporary job. Oh, you're saying type temporary thing. temp services? Maybe like Let's a temp look at it. type. Let's look at yeah. It. Um, I'm almost done, guys. I promise. Um, 
the substitute situation. I've had a lot of people email me about substitutes, concerns about, um, about uh, one concern is that Kelly Services substitutes travel from school to school, and that might not be great as far as contact tracing. So I'm thinking, could it be possible to possibly hire a additional staff member, like a para position at each school that could be kind of like a permanent sub? that would know the, how to use the lunch ed and could go into a class if a teacher needs to leave halfway through the day so we don't have to split up kids, which I don't even think we could split up kids at this point, but you know, something like that. Could we look at that? Uh, happy to look at that. Let me um, refresh your memory. Those who were around back when we went with Kelly Services, the issue was a single sub in a school does not help your absentee rate because the chances of only having one absence in a school per day is not likely. And so back when we had permanent subs, our um, vacancy rate, our fill rate for absent teachers was around 80 percent because you can't, only having one, unless you move them from school to school to help cover vacancies, having one at a school means that they do something else in the front office because nobody's absent, or they cover one classroom and there are several absences. It was not efficient. That's why we ended up going with the temp service because they could fill, they can grow and expand based on our needs at every school. Certainly happy to take a look at it again. It's an additional cost that um, just may not be available in the budget, but logistically the numbers are what drove us to Kelly Services because a single body on a 200-member staff at a high school, uh, a single individual is not going to have make a dent in their absentee needs, um, but happy to take a look at it again. Okay, and, and I think mainly it's just trying to wrap my head around how a substitute is going to learn how to use the whole launch ed system and be able to do that effectively with kids at home. Well, I can tell you Kelly's pretty committed to putting their folks through training, and, and a large number of their um, substitutes actually are degreed, and some of them are former teachers. Um, and so they, they have a pretty hefty um, capacity. Doesn't mean they can do it without fail. I think their capacity would be larger than one per school. Um, 200 essentially, but one assigned per school uh, for covering vacancies at a high school alone. We know that wouldn't be sufficient. But uh, Dr. Uh, Williams has been in touch with Kelly. They are eager to please. We will certainly work closely with them and see which one works out better for us um, financially and, and logistically. And do we have a plan in place if a teacher has to leave halfway through a day with what, like unexpectedly, what we would do with the class? So, yeah, that's, that's an old strategy where we used to have to split the class in an emergency. But chances are, on a typical campus, there's a CRT, there's a resource teacher, there's someone else who can be called upon to go in and cover that class. They need to go in with their fa face mask on, uh, as anyone else would. But there's usually another adult, even an AP, if we needed to, to cover in an emergency. Okay, thank you. Um, as far as the survey, or I don't think you called it a survey, you called it intention uh, registration, maybe, mm -hmm. um, for parents, can we be sure that we make it very clear or that we outline everything for face-to-face -face that would be expected um, and that would, that would entail as far as, you know, eating classroom, eating lunch in the classroom, maybe restricted recess, uh, mat face masks, of course, um, maybe no switching classes, all those things, because some of those things I think might be deal breakers for some parents, and they might choose virtual instead, but I think we just need to be really clear about that when we give them their choices of what that would entail. Um, the other thing I want to ask is about specials in elementary school. I haven't heard that mentioned today. Um, I know we talked about chorus, like um, in high school, but how are we thinking um, the specials in elementary are going to work? Go ahead. So actually, specials in elementary is a little bit easier um, than at the secondary level because, uh, again, you would be able to keep a class together and then have the teacher travel to the classroom with that group and not have the children. Um, move about. Okay. So the, our, our angst is at the secondary level because the transition is um, inevitable and, and the scheduling is much more difficult. 
I'm going to test um, someone's memory again. This is not new. It used to be that the music teacher, if a school mm -hmm. was packed pretty full, they traveled with a cart, or the art teacher traveled with a cart, or the un poquito de espanol teacher went from room to room. And so we're not unaccustomed to having, to having, I know that was pretty bad. But but we are accustomed to having the resource teachers come to the classroom. The guidance counselor comes in and does a lesson. We've been accustomed to that at elementary. It, it's m much easier to manage there. OK. Um, I know we have devices going to our elementary. Can we um, make sure that our high schools, I'm thinking um, ones that have older devices. I know our schools deal with a lot of broken devices or devices don't work. I hear about it a lot. So can we be assured that we will have a good supply? Um, and I say that because one of my high schools told me that at the end of the year, that not even at the end of the year, in, sometime in the spring, they were short on devices. Like some kids didn't even get a device when they had a broken device because they didn't have any available. So can we um, be assured that that's going to be addressed? So I want to, so I appreciate that question, Member Bird. I want to um, mention that when students take the devices, the parents have to sign a form. It says if you break it, if you damage it, you're supposed to pay a fee. Mm -hmm. And in some instances, when that is not done, then there may be an issue, or if there's absolute um, negligence on the part of, of the student. Now, if we were in class, in those instances, we would say, here's your laptop to use while you're here in class. You don't get to take it home until you pay for the one that you damaged. Now that we're not in class, we have to have some provision. Uh, uh, for those who are not in class, we would have to have some provision. But those are tax dollars that the community has invested in our young people, and, and we will need some accountability for the devices as well. Uh, every intention is to make sure students have the resources that they need uh, while they're on campus or during their instructional time. The high schoolers and the middle schoolers that we let take those devices back and forth are supposed to have some commitment and some requirement uh, should something happen to the device. And so um, we will certainly watch our breakage levels, uh, have every intention of having some renewal cycles to come through in years to come. Also, uh, there's a possibility that the high schoolers might keep the newest um, uh, uh, laptops, and those that are a little bit more dated can be used by the younger students because they don't need as much memory. Uh, all of that's being worked on, but we have to, we will stress over and over again, this community has invested in our children, and they have got to help us take care of those devices or pay the fines when they are required when something has happened to them. Now, does that mean everyone who didn't get their computer replaced hadn't paid for the repair? I can't tell you that for certain. Um, if all of the requirements are in place, they should have gotten a replacement. OK. Um, I just wanted to add my two cents about Florida virtual versus Orange County virtual because I've had experience with both with my daughter and um, we have found that she has taken the only reason she took courses through Florida virtual was because they weren't offered with Orange County virtual. So my question is, are we um, I'm assuming that we will offer there'll be more class offerings. The Orange County virtual. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're already okay. we're already in conversations um, and getting uh, the cost associated with adding more courses. Okay, and then um, almost done. I promise. Um, I just want to want John you to say one more time that I mean I'm I'm pretty clear on it, but I'm still getting emails that we do not have a choice about not opening the schools, correct? And if we were trying to be valiant and fight against, against the government, if we decided not to open, what would be the repercussion of that? Just to make that clear for thank, everyone listening. Thank you for that, DeAndre, and to that subject matter, because now I get to play the best angel of doom arguments <laughs> out. Uh, the order is very clear to me that it says that we have to have brick and mortar schools open by August. Um, if you all were to fail, and that, that could mean anywhere between August 10 to August 31. That would constitute being in August. 
If you all were to fail to do that, if you said, I'm not doing that, we think it's, you know, we're, we disagree with the order, um, then there is a provision in the Florida Constitution, Article 4, Section 7, I believe, that deals with removal of office of people, school board members. So um, there's an advisory opinion from the Florida Supreme Court in 1993 says that the governor can remove school board members for misfeasance and malfeasance. And misfeasance and malfeasance are defined terms. And hold on, I'm flipping to that because I actually have them here. Yeah. Okay. Um, the superintendent also has an obligation, even if the board tells her otherwise. Yes, that is correct as well. Malfeasance refers to evil conduct or an illegal deed, the doing of that which one ought not to do, the performance of an act by an officer in his, it, this was from 1934, so it was his, his official capacity that is wholly illegal and wrongful, which he has no right to perform or which he has contracted not to do. Misfeasance is, refers to the performance by an officer in his official capacity of a legal act in an improper or illegal manner, while malfeasance is doing an official act in an unlawful manner. In my opinion, if you all don't open by August 31st, that would be an illegal act and that could potentially subject you to removal. <laughs> well, if the kids don't come, that's obviously, so, yeah. Uh, if kids don't come, you know, we're going to have to teach the kids that do show up. I mean, we're not going to have nobody showing up. So clearly we will have a responsibility to educate those children. Um, if those children do not come to either OCPS or face-to-face -face learning, uh, you know, our launch ed model, our virtual model, or if they haven't transferred somewhere else, then we might have responsibilities as far as truancy would go. We would have to ensure that, you know, we have a responsibility to ensure that children go to school as well. So to the extent they do not do that, then we would be responsible for initiating truancy procedures. Like Tampa I said, Bird? I'm the angel of death I, at I this point. I think it's as clear as it can be. Yeah, uh, it totally is. I just wanted to have that said one more time. Um, and I just finally wanted to say um, that I... I can understand Dr. Gordon's um, concern about the procurement and the opportunities um, for our local um, community, uh, just being good partners. I think that that's, I mean, I think it's a great idea anyway, but I think being good partners um, in this economic uncertainty for a lot of families, I think that that's a great, great thing to be aware of. And, you know, I know that, uh, Procurement Office offers the How to Do Business with OCPS seminar. Of, uh, I think they do it maybe every month or so, but maybe we could um, put that out there again and say, you know, encourage with some kind of encouragement to our local families and local community to check out How to Do Business with OCPS. I don't know. Might be a good idea. And that's it for me. Thank you. Member Cobert. Okay, that's my final comment, and it is a plea to our community for partnership. Parents, you need to turn to your neighbors and help each other. You need to help each other with carpool so that we can lower the density on our buses. We need to, to take a serious look at our virtual options so that we can uh, lower the density on our campuses. We need your help in creating a culture of health and safety. Teach your little ones about the safety protocols that are required at school and at home. We won't have to do this forever, but we need your help in teaching them now. And please support our teachers. They're our frontline workers, they're essential, and they need your support now more than ever. To our charitable partners who often do uh, school supply drives, take a look, contact your individual schools. Some of those schools may need individual supplies for students so that they're not sharing common supplies. So ask your local schools what is it that they need, and don't forget masks and other sanitary supplies, especially this year. To our business community, help us support our teachers. 
who we know now more than ever are essential to your businesses and to our community as a whole, our parents, our teachers, our unions, and our district. May we all operate together with flexibility, compassion, grace, patience, and kindness. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Member Gould. Vice Chair Gould. I had two things. One, in follow-up to the thermometers, there is technology out there, and I had forwarded that to the team a few weeks ago, and I can re-forward it, it, or re-forward it. I can't even put a sentence together anymore. Um, it, where they're almost uh, very inexpensive thermometers that are taken home, but there's an app and it, and it aggregates it also, gives you very early warning signs on multiple things, flus, cold spreads, and of course COVID. So that may be a solution, especially in our lower grades um, or maybe even in the more dense uh, schools. The other thing we did not talk about tonight, and I know this is the start of the conversation, not the end, but is our CTE magnet and um, vocational training programs, some of which cannot be delivered well virtually, although we've had some very, very clever teachers, like the one from the Lakaiva Culinary Program. Uh, but overall, if you need to weld, you can't set that up at home and do it. Um, how are we addressing that and to help these uh, people who were interrupted complete their certification going into the new year? And if you can't answer that tonight, um, we can take that and maybe just make sure that that gets broadcast out because I've had questions about that. Thank you. That's what we'll do. Thank you, Vice Chair Gould. Let me, um, let me just close by thanking the superintendent, her team, everyone who has stayed with us um, here in the room this evening, the board for a very thoughtful and deliberative discussion, um, and most especially the thousands of people who have um, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people who have given us feedback and input, and the thousands of people that have tuned in tonight to, um, to, to be informed and to be better aware of the challenges that we face at the difficult situation this board is in based on the order that we received yesterday. Um, and um, to echo the words, I think um, Member Cobert said it worse, uh, sorry, said it best that we need as a community to pull together um, and we need to make the best and the smartest choices that we can for our children and collectively for our community. And I am confident that this community, as it always does, will rise to that occasion. So we will adjourn the meeting now. We will come back next week. Um, we will make a decision as best as we can under the circumstances so that we can give some certainty to our parents as quickly as possible and our teachers. Good, good night. God bless. Stay well.